In the Year 2889 by Jules Verne and Michael Verne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan McAdam. In the Year 2889. Redactor's Note. In the Year 2889 was first published in the Forum, February 1889, page 262. It was published in France the next year. Although published under the name of Jules Verne, it is now believed to be chiefly, if not entirely, the work of Jules' son, Michael Verne. In any event, many of the topics in the article echo Verne's ideas. In the year 2889, little though they seem to think of it, the people of this 29th century live continually in fairyland. Surfeited as they are with marvels, they are indifferent in the presence of each new marvel. To them they all seem natural. Could they but duly appreciate the refinements of civilization in our day? Could they but compare the present with the past, and so better comprehend the advance we have made? How much fairer they would find our modern towns, with populations amounting sometimes to ten million souls, their streets three hundred feet wide, their houses a thousand feet in height, with a temperature the same in all seasons, with their lines of aerial locomotion crossing the sky in every direction, if they would but picture to themselves the state of things that once existed, when through muddy streets rumbling boxes on wheels drawn by horses, yes, by horses, were the only means of conveyance. Think of the railroads of the olden time, and you will be able to appreciate the pneumatic tubes through which today one travels at the rate of 1,000 miles an hour. Would not our contemporaries prize the telephone and the telephote more highly if they had not forgotten the telegraph? Singularly enough, all these transformations rest upon principles which were perfectly familiar to our remote ancestors, but which they disregarded. Heat, for instance, is as ancient as man himself. Electricity was known 3,000 years ago, and steam 1,100 years ago. Nay, so early as ten centuries ago it was known that the difference between the several chemical and physical forces depend on the mode of vibration of the etheric particles, which is for each specifically different. When at last the kinship of all these forces was discovered, it is simply astounding that five hundred years should still have to elapse before men could analyze and describe the several modes of vibration that constitute these differences. Above all, it is singular that the mode of reproducing these forces directly from one another, and of reproducing one without the others, should have remained undiscovered till less than a hundred years ago. Nevertheless, such was the course of events, for it was not until the year 2792 that the famous Oswald Neer made this great discovery. Truly was he a great benefactor of the human race. His admirable discovery led to many other, Hence has sprung a pleiad of inventors, its brightest star being our great Joseph Jackson. To Jackson we are indebted for those wonderful instruments, the new accumulators. Some of these absorb and condense the living force contained in the sun's rays. Others, the electricity stored in our globe. Others, again, the energy coming from whatever source, as a waterfall, a stream, the winds, etc. He, too, it was that invented the transformer, a more wonderful contrivance still, which takes the living force from the accumulator and, on the simple pressure of a button, gives it back to space in whatever form may be desired, whether as heat, light, electricity, or mechanical force, after having first obtained from it the work required. From the day when these two instruments were contrived, it is to be dated the era of true progress. They have put into the hands of man a power that is almost infinite. As for their applications, they are numberless, mitigating the rigors of winter, giving back the atmosphere the surplus heat stored up during the summer. They have revolutionized agriculture. By supplying motive power for aerial navigation, they have given to commerce a mighty impetus. To them we are indebted for the continuous production of electricity without batteries or dynamos, of light without combustion or incandescence and for an unfailing supply of mechanical energy for all the needs of industry. Yes, all these wonders have been wrought by the accumulator and the transformer. 
And can we not to them also trace, indirectly, this latest wonder of all, the great Earth Chronicle building in 253rd Avenue, which was dedicated the other day? If George Washington Smith, the founder of the Manhattan Chronicle, should come back to life today, what would he think were he to be told that this palace of marble and gold belongs to his remote descendant, Fritz Napoleon Smith, who, after thirty generations have come and gone, is owner of the same newspaper which his ancestor established. For George Washington Smith's newspaper has lived generation after generation, now passing out of the family and on coming back to it, when, two hundred years ago, the political center of the United States was transferred from Washington to Centropolis, the newspaper followed the government and assumed the name of Earth Chronicle. Unfortunately, it was unable to maintain itself at the high level of its name. Pressed on all sides by rival journals of a more modern type, it was continually in danger of collapse. Twenty years ago, its subscription list contained but a few hundred thousand names. And then Mr. Fritz Napoleon Smith bought it for a mere trifle and originated telephonic journalism. Everyone is familiar with Fritz Napoleon Smith's system, a system made possible by the enormous development of telephony during the last hundred years. Instead of being printed, the Earth Chronicle is every morning spoken to subscribers, who, in interesting conversations with reporters, statesmen, and scientists, learn the news of the day. Furthermore, each subscriber owns a phonograph, and to this instrument he leaves the task of gathering the news whenever he happens not to be in a mood to listen directly himself. As for purchasers of single copies, they can at a very trifling cost learn all that is in the paper of the day at any of the innumerable phonographs set up nearly anywhere. Fritz Napoleon Smith's innovation galvanized the old newspaper. In the course of a few years, the number of subscribers grew to be 80 million, and Smith's wealth went on growing. Till now, it reaches the almost unimaginable figure of $10 billion. This lucky hit has enabled him to erect his new building, a vast edifice of the four facades, each 3,250 feet in length, over which proudly floats the hundred-starred flag of the Union. Thanks to the same lucky hit, he is today the king of newspaperdom. Indeed, he would be king of all Americans, too, if Americans could ever accept a king. You do not believe it? Well then, look at the plenipotentiaries of all nations, and our own ministers themselves crowding about his door, entreating his counsels, begging for his approbation, imploring the aid of his all-powerful organ. Reckon up the number of scientists and artists that he supports, of inventors that he has under his pay. Yes, a king is he, and in truth his is a royalty full of burdens. His labors are incessant, and there is no doubt at all that in earlier times any man would have succumbed under the overpowering stress of the toil which Mr. Smith has to perform. Very fortunately for him, thanks to the progress of hygiene, which, abating all the old sources of unhealthfulness, has lifted the mean of human life from 37 up to 52 years. Men have stronger constitutions now than heretofore. The discovery of nutritive air is still in the future, but in the meantime, men today consume food that is compounded and prepared according to scientific principles, and they breathe an atmosphere freed from the microorganisms that formerly used to swarm in it. Hence, they live longer than their forefathers and know nothing of the innumerable diseases of olden times. Nevertheless, and notwithstanding these considerations, Fritz Napoleon Smith's mode of life may well astonish one. His iron constitution is taxed to the utmost by the heavy strain that is put upon it. Vain the attempt to estimate the amount of labor he undergoes, an example alone can give an idea of it. Let us then go about with him for one day as he attends his multifarious concernments. What day? That matters little. It is the same every day. Let us then take at random September 25th of this present year, 2889. This morning, Mr. Fritz Napoleon Smith awoke in very bad humor. His wife having left for France eight days ago, he was feeling disconsolate. Incredible though it seems, in all the ten years since their marriage, this is the first time that Mrs. Edith Smith, the professional beauty, has been so long absent from home. Two or three days usually suffice for her frequent trips to Europe. 
The first thing that Mr. Smith does is to connect his phonotelephote, the wires of which communicate with his Paris mansion. The telephote. Here is another of the great triumphs of science in our time. The transmission of speech is an old story. The transmission of images by means of sensitive mirrors connected by wires is a thing but of yesterday. A valuable invention indeed, and Mr. Smith this morning was not niggard of blessings for the inventor, when by his aid he was able to distinctly see his wife, notwithstanding the distance that separated him from her. Mrs. Smith, wary after the ball or the visit to the theater the preceding night, is still abed, though it is near noontide at Paris. She is asleep, her head sunk in the lace-covered pillows. What? She stirs. Her lips move. She is dreaming, perhaps. Yes, dreaming. She is talking, pronouncing a name. His name, Fritz. The delightful vision gave a happier turn to Mr. Smith's thoughts. And now, at the call of imperative duty, light-hearted he springs from his bed and enters his mechanical dresser. Two minutes later, the machine deposited him, all dressed at the threshold of his office. The round of journalistic work has now begun. First, he enters the hall of the novel writers, a vast apartment crowned with an enormous transparent cupola. In one corner is a telephone, through which a hundred earth conical literatures, in turn, recount to the public in daily installments a hundred novels. Addressing one of these authors who was waiting his turn, Capital, capital, my dear fellow, he said, your last story. The scene where the village maid discusses interesting philosophical problems with her lover shows your very acute powers of observation. Never have the ways of country folk been better portrayed. Keep on, my dear Archibald, keep on. Since yesterday, thanks to you, there is a gain of 5,000 subscribers. Mr. John Last, he began again, turning to a new arrival. I am not so well pleased with your work. Your story is not a picture of life. It lacks the elements of truth. And why? Simply because you run straight on to the end, because you do not analyze. Your heroes do this thing or that from this or that motive, which you assign without ever a thought of dissecting their mental and moral natures. Our feelings, you must remember, are far more complex than that. In real life, every act is the resultant of a hundred thoughts that come and go, and these you must study, each by itself, if you would create a living character. But, you will say, in order to note those fleeting thoughts, one must know them, must be able to follow them in their capricious meanderings. Why, any child can do that, as you know. You have simply to make use of hypnotism, electrical or human, which gives one a twofold being, setting free the witness personality so that it may see, understand, and remember the reasons which determine the personality that acts. Just study yourself as you live from day to day, my dear last. Imitate your associate who I was complimenting a moment ago. Let yourself be hypnotized. What's that? You've tried it already? Not sufficiently, then. Not sufficiently. Mr. Smith continues his round and enters the reporter's hall. Here, 1,500 reporters, in their respective places facing an equal number of telephones, are communicating to the subscribers the news of the world as gathered during the night. The organization of this matchless service has often been described. Beside his telephone, each reporter, as the reader is aware, has in front of him a set of commutators, which enables him to communicate with any desired telephonic line. Thus the subscribers not only hear the news, but see the occurrences. When an incident is described that is already passed, photographs of its main features are transmitted with the narrative. And there is no confusion with all. The reporter's items, just like the different stories and all the other component parts of the journal, are classified automatically according to an ingenious system, and reach the hearer in due succession. Furthermore, the hearers are free to listen only to what specially concerns them. They may at a pleasure give attention to one editor and refuse it to another. Mr. Smith addresses one of the ten reporters in the astronomical department, a department still in the embryonic stage, but which will yet play an important part in journalism. Well, Cash, what's the news? We have phototelegrams from Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Are those from Mars of any interest? Yes, indeed. There is a revolution in the Central Empire. And what of Jupiter? asked Mr. Smith. Nothing as of yet. We cannot quite understand their signals. Perhaps ours do not reach them. That's bad, exclaimed Mr. Smith as he hurried away, not in the best of humor, toward the hall of the scientific editors. 
with their heads bent down over their electrical computers, thirty scientific men were absorbed in transcendental calculations. The coming of Mr. Smith was like the falling of a bomb among them. Well, gentlemen, what is this I hear? No answer from Jupiter? Is it always to be thus? Come, Cooley, you have been at work now twenty years on this problem, and yet... True enough, the man replied, our science of optics is still very defective, and through our mile and three-quarter telescopes... Listen to that, Pierre, broke in Mr. Smith, turning to a second scientist. Optical science defective. Optical science is your specialty, but he continued, again addressing William Cooley. Failing with Jupiter, are we getting any results from the moon? The case is no better there. This time you do not lay blame on the science of optics. The moon is immeasurably less distant than Mars, yet with Mars our communication is fully established. I presume you will not say that you lack telescopes. Telescopes? Oh no, the trouble here is about inhabitants. That's it, added Pierre. So then, the moon is positively uninhabited? asked Mr. Smith. At least, answered Cooley, on the face which she presents to us. As for the opposite side, who knows? Ah, the opposite side. You think, then, remarked Mr. Smith, musingly, that if one could but... Could what? Why, turn the moon about face. Ah, there's something about that, cried the two men at once and indeed, so confident was their air, they seemed to have no doubt as to the possibility of success in such an undertaking. Meanwhile, asked Mr. Smith, after a moment's silence, have you no news of interest today? Indeed we have, answered Cooley. The elements of Olympus are definitively settled. The great planet gravitates beyond Neptune at the distance of 11,400,799,642 miles from the sun, and to traverse its vast orbit takes 1,311 years, 294 days, 12 hours, 43 minutes, 9 seconds. Why didn't you tell me that sooner? cried Mr. Smith. Now inform the reporters of this straight away. You know how eager is the curiosity of the public with regard to these astronomical questions. That news must go into today's issue. Then, the two men bowing to him, Mr. Smith passed into the next hall, an enormous gallery upward of 3,200 feet in length, devoted to atmospheric advertising. Everyone has noticed those enormous advertisements reflected from the clouds, so large that they may be seen by the populations of whole cities or even entire countries. This, too, is one of Mr. Fritz Napoleon Smith's ideas and in the Earth Chronicle building a thousand projectors are constantly engaged in displaying upon the clouds these mammoth advertisements. When Mr. Smith today entered the Sky Advertising Department, he found the operators sitting with folded arms at their motionless projectors, and inquired as to the cause of their inaction. In response, the man addressed simply pointed to the sky, which was of a pure blue. Yes, uh, muttered Mr. Smith, a cloudless sky. That's too bad, but what's to be done? Shall we produce rain? That might do, but is it of any use? What we need is clouds, not rain. Go, said he, addressing the head engineer. Go see Mr. Samuel Mark of the meteorological division of the scientific department and tell him for me to go to work in earnest on the question of artificial clouds. It will never do for us to be always thus at the mercy of cloudless skies. Mr. Smith's daily tour through the several departments of his newspaper is now finished. Next, from the advertisement hall, he passes to the reception chamber, where the ambassadors accredited to the American government are awaiting him, desirous of having a word of counsel or advice from the all-powerful editor. A discussion was going on when he entered. Your Excellency will pardon me, the French ambassador was saying to the Russian, but I see nothing in the map of Europe that requires change. The Norse for the Slavs. Why, yes, of course, but the South for the Martins. Our common frontier, the Rhine, it seems to me, serves very well. Besides, my government, as you know, will firmly oppose every movement, not only against Paris, our capital, or our two great prefectures, Rome and Madrid, but also against the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Dominion of St. Peter, of which France means to be trusty defender. Well said, exclaimed Mr. Smith. 
How is it, he asked, turning to the Russian ambassador, that you Russians are not content with your vast empire, the most extensive in the world, stretching from the banks of the Rhine to the celestial mountains in the Karakoram, whose shores are washed by the frozen ocean, the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, and the Indian Ocean. Then, what is the use of threats? Is war possible in view of modern inventions? Asphyxiating shells capable of being projected at a distance of 60 miles, an electric spark of 90 miles that can at one stroke annihilate a battalion, to say nothing of the plague, the cholera, the yellow fever, and the belligerence that might spread among their antagonists mutually, which would in a few days destroy the greatest armies. True, answered the Russian, but can we do all that we wish? As for us Russians, pressed on our eastern frontier by the Chinese. We must at any cost put forth our strengths for an effort towards the West. Oh, is that all? In that case, said Mr. Smith, the thing can be arranged. I will speak to the Secretary of State about it. The attention of the Chinese government shall be called to the matter. This is not the first time that the Chinese have bothered us. Under these conditions, of course and the Russian ambassador declared himself satisfied. "'Ah, Sir John, what can I do for you?' asked Mr. Smith as he turned to the representative of the people of Great Britain, who till now had remained silent. "'A great deal,' was the reply. "'If the Earth Chronicle would but open a campaign on our behalf. "'And for what object?' "'Simply for the annulment of the Act of Congress "'annexing the United States to the British Islands.' Though, by a just turnabout of things here below, Great Britain has become a colony of the United States, the English are not yet reconciled to the situation. At regular intervals they are ever addressing to the American government vain complaints. A campaign against the annexation that has been an accomplished fact for a hundred and fifty years? exclaimed Mr. Smith. How can your people suppose that I would do anything so unpatriotic? We at home think your people must now be sated. The Monroe Doctrine is fully applied. The whole of America belongs to the Americans. What more do you want? Besides, we will pay for what we ask. Indeed, answered Mr. Smith, without manifesting the slightest irritation. Well, you English will ever be the same. No, no, Sir John, do not count on me for help. Give up our fairest province, Britain? Why not ask France generously to renounce possession of Africa, the magnificent colony, the complete conquest of which cost her the labor of eight hundred years. You'll be well received. You decline. All is over then, murmured the British agent sadly. The United Kingdom falls to the share of the Americans. The Indies to that of the Russians, said Mr. Smith, completing the sentence. Australia has an independent government. Then nothing at all remains for us sighed Sir John, downcast. Nothing, asked Mr. Smith, laughing. Well, now there's Gibraltar. With this sally, the audience ended. The clock was striking twelve, the hour of breakfast. Mr. Smith returns to his chamber. Where the bed stood in the morning, a table all spread comes up through the floor. For Mr. Smith, being above all a practical man, has reduced the problem of existence to its simplest terms. For him, instead of the endless suites of apartments of the olden time, one room fitted with ingenious mechanical contrivances is enough. Here he sleeps, takes his meals, in short, lives. He seats himself. In the mirror of the phonotelephote is seen the same chamber at Paris which appeared in it this morning. A table furnished forth is likewise in readiness here. For notwithstanding the difference of hours, Mr. Smith and his wife have arranged to take their meals simultaneously. It is delightful, then, to take meals tete-a-tete -tete with one who is three thousand miles away or so. Just now, Mrs. Smith's chamber has no occupant. She is late. Women's punctuality. Progress everywhere except there, muttered Mr. Smith as he turned the tap for the first dish. For like all wealthy folk in our day, Mr. Smith has done away with the domestic kitchen and is a subscriber to the Grand Alimentation Company, which sends through a great network of tubes to subscribers' residences all sorts of dishes, as a varied assortment is always in readiness. A subscription costs money, to be sure, 
but the cuisine is the best, and the system has this advantage that it does away with the pestering race of the cordon bleu. Mr. Smith received and ate, all alone, the hors d'oeuvre, entree, roti, and legumes that constituted the repast. He was just finishing the dessert when Mrs. Smith appeared in the mirror of the telephone. Why, where have you been? asked Mr. Smith through the telephone. What, you are already at dessert? Then I am late she exclaimed with a winsome naivete. Where have I been, you ask? Why, at the dressmaker's. The hats are just lovely this season. I suppose I forgot to note the time, and so I'm a little late. Yes, a little, growled Mr. Smith. So little that I've already quite finished breakfast. Excuse me if I leave you now, I must be going. Oh, certainly, my dear. Goodbye till evening. Smith stepped into his air coach, which was in waiting for him at a window. "'Where do you wish to go, sir?' inquired the coachman. "'Let me see. I have three hours,' Mr. Smith mused. "'Jack, take me to the accumulator works at Niagara.' For Mr. Smith has obtained a lease of the Great Falls of Niagara. For ages the energy developed by the falls went unutilized. Smith, applying Jackson's invention, now collects this energy— and Letzer sells it. His visit to the works took more time than he had anticipated. It was four o'clock when he returned home, just in time for the daily audience which he grants to callers. One readily understands how a man situated as Smith is must be set with requests of all kind. Now it is an inventor needing capital. Again it is some visionary who comes to advocate a brilliant scheme which must surely yield millions of profit. A choice has to be made between these projects, rejecting the worthless, examining the questionable ones, accepting the meritorious. To this work Mr. Smith devotes every day two full hours. The callers were fewer today than usual, only twelve of them. Of these, eight had only impracticable schemes to propose. In fact, one of them wanted to revive painting, an art fallen into desuetude owing to the progress made in color photography. Another, a physician, boasted that he had discovered a cure for nasal catarrh. These impracticables were dismissed in short order. Of the four projects favorably received, the first was that of a young man whose broad forehead betokened his intellectual power. Sir, I am a chemist, he began, and as such I come to you. Well? Once the elementary bodies, said the young chemist, were held to be sixty-two in number. A hundred years ago they were reduced to ten. Now only three remain irresolvable, as you are aware. Yes, yes. Well, sir, these also I will show to be composite. In a few months, a few weeks, I shall have succeeded in solving the problem. Indeed, it may only take a few days. And then? Then, sir, I shall simply have determined the absolute. All I want is money enough to carry my research to a successful issue. Very well, said Mr. Smith. And what will be the practical outcome of your discovery? The practical outcome? Why, that we shall be able to produce easily all bodies whatever. Stone, wood, metal, fibers. And flesh and blood? queried Mr. Smith, interrupting him. Do you pretend that you expect to manufacture a human being out and out? Why not? Mr. Smith advanced a hundred thousand dollars to the young chemist, and engaged his services for the Earth Chronicle Laboratory. The second of the four successful applicants starting from experiments made so long ago as the 19th century and again and again repeated, had conceived the idea of removing an entire city all at once from one place to another. His special project had to do with the city of Granton, situated, as everybody knows, some 15 miles inland. He proposes the transport of the city on rails and to change it into a watering place. The profit, of course, would be enormous. Mr. Smith, captivated by the scheme, bought a half-interest in it. "'As you are aware, sir,' began applicant number three, "'by the aid of our solar and terrestrial accumulators and transformers, "'we are able to make all the seasons the same. "'I propose to do something better still. "'Transform into heat a portion of the surplus energy at our disposal. "'Send this heat to the poles. "'Then the polar regions, relieved of their snow cap, "'will become a vast territory available for man's use.' What think you of the scheme? Leave your plans to me, and come back in a week. I will have them examined in the meantime. 
Finally, the fourth announced the early solution of a weighty scientific problem. Everyone will remember the bold experiment made a hundred years ago by Dr. Nathaniel Faithburn. The doctor, being a firm believer in human hibernation, in other words, in the possibility of our suspending our vital functions and of calling them into action again after a time, resolved to subject the theory to a practical test. To this end, having first made his last will and pointed out the proper method of awakening him, having also directed that his sleep was to continue a hundred years to a day from the date of his apparent death, he unhesitatingly put the theory to the proof in his own person. Reduced to the condition of a mummy, Dr. Faithburn was coffined and laid in a tomb. Time went on, September 25th, 2889 being the day set for his resurrection, it was proposed to Mr. Smith that he should permit the second part of the experiment to be performed at his residence this evening. Agreed. Be here at ten o'clock, answered Mr. Smith, and with that the day's audience was closed. Left to himself, feeling tired, he lay down on an extension chair. Then, touching a knob, he established communication with the central concert hall, whence our greatest maestros send out to subscribers their delightful successions of accords determined by recondite algebraic formulas. Night was approaching, entranced by the harmony, forgetful of the hour, Smith did not notice that it was growing dark. It was quite dark when he was aroused by the sound of a door opening. Who is there? he asked, touching a commutator. Suddenly, in a consequence of the vibrations produced, the air became luminous. Ah, you doctor? Yes, was the reply. How are you? I'm feeling well. Good. Let me see your tongue. All right. Your pulse, regular, and your appetite? Only passably good. Yes, the stomach. There's the rub. You're overworked. If your stomach is out of repair, it must be mended. That requires study. We must think about it. In the meantime, said Mr. Smith, you will dine with me. As in the morning, the table rose out of the floor. Again, as in the morning, the potage, roti, ragout, and legumes were supplied through the food pipes. Towards the close of the meal, phonotelephotic communication was made with Paris. Smith saw his wife, seated alone at the dinner table, looking anything but pleased with her loneliness. Pardon me, my dear, for having left you alone, he said through the telephone. I was with Dr. Wilkins. Ah, the good doctor, remarked Mrs. Smith, her countenance lighting up. Yes, but pray, when are you coming home? This evening. Very well. Do you come by tube or by air train? Oh, by tube. Yes, and what hour will you arrive? About eleven, I suppose. Eleven by Semtropolis time, you mean? Yes. Goodbye, then, for a little while, said Mr. Smith as he severed communication with Paris. Dinner over, Dr. Wilkins wished to depart. I shall expect you at ten, said Mr. Smith. Today, it seems, is the day for the return to life of the famous Dr. Faithburn. You did not think of it, I suppose. The awakening is to take place here in my house. You must come and see. I shall depend on you being here. I will come back, answered Dr. Wilkins. Left alone, Mr. Smith busied himself with examining his accounts, a task of vast magnitude, having to do with transactions which involved a daily expenditure of upward of $800,000. Fortunately, indeed, the stupendous progress of mechanic art in modern times makes it comparatively easy. Thanks to the piano electro reckoner, the most complex calculations can be made in a few seconds. In two hours, Mr. Smith completed his task, just in time. Scarcely had he turned over the last page when Dr. Wilkins arrived. After him came the body of Dr. Faithburn, escorted by a numerous company of men of science. They commenced work at once, the casket being laid down in the middle of the room, the telephote was got in readiness. The outer world, already notified, was anxiously expectant, for the whole world could be eyewitnesses to the performance. A reporter, meanwhile, like the chorus in the ancient drama, explaining it all viva voce through the telephone. They are opening the casket, he explained. Now they are taking Faithburn out of it, a veritable mummy, yellow, hard, and dry. Strike the body and it resounds like a block of wood. They are now applying heat, now electricity, no result. The experiments are suspended for a moment while Dr. Wilkins makes an examination of the body. 
Dr. Wilkins, rising, declares the man to be dead. Dead, exclaims everyone present. Yes, answers Dr. Wilkins, dead. And how long has he been dead? Dr. Wilkins makes another examination. A hundred years, he replies. The case stood just as the reporter said. Faithburn was dead, quite certainly dead. Here is a method that needs improvement, remarks Mr. Smith to Dr. Wilkins as the Scientific Committee on Hibernation bore the casket out. So much for that experiment. But if poor Faithburn is dead, at least he is sleeping, he continued. I wish I could get some sleep. I am tired out, doctor, quite tired out. Do you not think that a bath would refresh me? Certainly, but you must wrap yourself up well before you go out into the hallway. You must not expose yourself to cold. Hallway? Why, doctor, as you well know, everything is done by machinery here. It is not for me to go to the bath. The bath will come to me. Just look. Andy pressed a button. After a few seconds, a faint rumbling was heard, which grew louder and louder. Suddenly the door opened and the tub appeared. Such, for this year of grace, 2889, is the history of one day in the life of the editor of the Earth Chronicle. And the history of that one day is the history of 365 days every year, except leap years, and then 366 days. For as yet no means has been found of increasing the length of the terrestrial year. Jules Verne End of In the Year 2889 by Jules Verne and Michael Verne Recording by Dan McAdam Once a Greech by Evelyn E. Smith This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org once a Greech by Evelyn E. Smith Just two weeks before the S.S. Herringbone of the Interstellar Exploration, Examination, and Exploitation Service was due to start her return journey to Earth, one of her scouts disconcertingly reported the discovery of intelligent life in the Virago system. Thirteen planets, Captain Iverson snarled, wishing there were someone on whom he could place the blame for this mischance and we spent a full year here exploring each one of them with all the resources of terrestrial science and technology. And what happens? On the nineteenth moon of the eleventh planet, intelligent life is discovered. And who has to discover it? Harkaway, of all people. I thought for sure all the moons were cinders, or I would never have sent him out to them just to keep him from getting in my hair. The boy's not a bad boy, sir, the first officer said. Just a thought incompetent, that's all, which is to be expected if the service will choose its officers on the basis of written examinations. I'm glad to see him make good." Iverson would have been glad to see Harkaway make good, too, only such a concept seemed utterly beyond the bounds of possibility. From the moment the young man had first set foot on the S.S. Herringbone, he had seemed unable to make anything but bad. Even in such a conglomeration of fools under Captain Iverson, his idiocy was of outstanding quality. The captain, however, had not been wholly beyond reproach in this instance, as he himself knew. Pity he had made such an error about the eleventh planet's moons. It was really such a small mistake. Moons one to eighteen and twenty to forty-six still appeared to be cinders. It was all too easy for the spectroscope to overlook Flimbot the nineteenth but it would be Flimbot which had turned out to be a green and pleasant planet, very similar to Earth, or so Harkaway reported on the intercom. "'And the other forty-five aren't really moons at all,' he began. "'There—' "'You can tell me all that when we reach Flimbot,' Iverson interrupted. "'Which should be in about six hours. Remember, that intercom uses a lot of power and we're tight on fuel.' but it proved to be more than six days later before the ship reached Flimbot. This was owing to certain mechanical difficulties that arose when the crew tried to lift the mothership from the third planet, on which it was based. For sentimental reasons, the IEEE always tried to establish its prime base on the third planet of a system. Anyhow, when the herringbone was on the point of takeoff, it was discovered that the rock-eating species which was the only life on the third planet 
had eaten all the projecting metal parts on the ship, including the rocket exhaust tubes, the airlock handles, and the chromium trim. I had been wondering what made the little fellow so sick, Smullyan, the ship's doctor, said. They went womp, womp, womp all night long until my heart bled for them. Ah, everywhere it goes, humanity spreads the fell seeds of death and destruction. Are you a doctor or a veterinarian? Iverson demanded furiously. By Betelgeuse, you act as if I crammed those blasted tubes down their sticking little throats. It was you who invaded their paradise with your ship. It was you. Shut up! Iverson yelled. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up! So Dr. Smullyan went off, like many a ship's physician before him, and got good and drunk on the medical stores. By the time they finally arrived on Flimbot, Harkaway had already gone native. He appeared at the airlock wearing nothing but a brief, colorful loincloth of alien fabric, and a wreath of flowers in his hair. He was fondling a large, woolly, pink caterpillar. "'Where is your uniform, sir?' Captain Iverson barked, aghast. If there was one thing he was intolerant of in his command, it was sloppiness. "'This is the undress uniform of the Royal Flambatsi Navy, sir. I was given the privilege of wearing one as a great misugri, honor, to our race. If I were to return to my own uniform, it might set back diplomatic relations between Flimbot and Earth as much as—' "'All right,' the captain snapped. "'All right, all right, all right!' He didn't ask any questions about the Royal Flimbotsi Navy. He had deduced its nature when, on nearing Flimbot, he had discovered that the eleventh planet actually had only one moon. The other forty-five celestial objects were spacecraft, quaint and primitive, it was true, but spacecraft nonetheless. Probably it was their orbital formation that had made him think they were moons. Oh, the crew must be in great spirits. They did so enjoy having a good laugh at his expense. He looked for something with which to reproach Harkaway, and his eye lighted on the caterpillar. "'What's that thing you're carrying there?' he barked. Raising itself on its tail, the caterpillar barked right back at him. Captain Iverson paled. First he had overlooked the spacecraft, and now, after thirty years of faithful service to the IEEE in the less desirable sectors of space, he had committed the ultimate error in his first contact with a new form of intelligent life. "'Sorry, sir,' he said, forgetting that the creature, whatever its mental prowess, could hardly be expected to understand Terran yet. I am just a simple spaceman and my ways are crude, but I mean no harm." He whirled on Harkaway. "'I thought you said the natives were humanoid!' The young officer grinned. "'They are. This is just a Greech. Cuddly little fellow, isn't he?' The Greech licked Harkaway's face with a tripartite blue tongue. The Flambotsik are mad about pets. Great animal lovers. That's how I knew I could trust them right from the start. Show me a life-form that loves animals, I always say, and—' "'I'm not interested in what you always say,' Iverson interrupted, knowing Harkaway's premise was fundamentally unsound, because he himself was the kindliest of all men, and he hated animals. And although he didn't hate Harkaway, who was not an animal, save in the strictly Darwinian sense, he could not repress unsportsmanlike feelings of bitterness. Why couldn't it have been one of the other officers who had discovered the Flimbotsik? Why must it be Harkaway, the most inept of his scouts, whose only talent seemed to be the egregious error, who always rushed into a thing half-cocked, who mistook superficialities for profundities, Harkaway, the blundering fool, the blithering idiot, who had stumbled into this greatest discovery of Iverson's career and, of course, Harkaway's, too. Well, life was like that, and always had been. "'Have you tested those air and soil samples yet?' Iverson snarled into his communicator, for his spacesuit was beginning to itch again as the gentle warmth of Flimbot activated certain small and opportunistic life-forms which had emigrated from a previous system along with the Terrans. "'We're running them through as fast as we can, sir,' said a harried voice. We can offer you no more than our poor best." "'But why bother with all that?' Harkaway wanted to know. "'This planet is absolutely safe for human life. I can guarantee it personally.' "'On what basis?' Iverson asked. 
Well, I've been here for two weeks, and I've survived, haven't I?" That, Iverson told him, does not prove that the planet can sustain human life. Harkaway laughed richly. Wonderful how you can still keep that marvelous sense of humor, Skipper, after all the things that have been going wrong on the voyage. Ah, here comes the Flim too, the welcoming committee, he said quickly. They were a little shy before, because of the rockets, you know. Don't their ships have any? They don't seem to. They're really very primitive affairs, barely able to go from planet to planet. If they go, Iverson said, stands to reason something must power them. I really don't know what it is, Harkaway retorted defensively. After all, even though I've been busy as a beaver, three weeks would hardly give me time to investigate every aspect of their culture. Don't you think the natives are remarkably humanoid? He changed the subject. They were, indeed. Except for a somewhat greenish cast of countenance and distinctly purple hair, as they approached, in their brief gay garments and flower garlands, the natives resembled nothing so much as a group of idealized South Sea Islanders of the nineteenth century. Gigantic butterflies whizzed about their heads. Countless small animals frisked about their feet, more of the pink caterpillars bright blue creatures that were a winsome combination of monkey and koala, a kind of large, merry-eyed snake that moved by holding its tail in its mouth and rolling like a hoop. All had faces that reminded the captain of the work of the celebrated twentieth-century artist W. Disney. "'By Polaris!' he cried in disgust. "'I might have known you'd find a cute planet!' "'Moon, actually,' the first officer said since it is in orbit around Virago Eleven, rather than Virago itself." "'Would you have wanted them to be hostile?' Harkaway asked peevishly. "'Honestly, some people never seem to be satisfied.' From his proprietary airs, one would think Harkaway had created the natives himself. "'At least with hostile races you know where you are,' Iverson said. "'I always suspect friendly life-forms. Friendliness simply isn't a natural instinct. Who's being anthropomorphic now? Harkaway chided. Iverson flushed, for he had berated the young man for that particular fault on more than one occasion. Harkaway was too prone to interpret alien traits in terms of terrestrial culture. Previously, since all intelligent life forms with which the herringbone had come into contact had already been discovered by somebody else, that didn't matter too much. In this instance, however, any mistakes of contact or interpretation mattered terribly. And Iverson couldn't see Harkaway not making a mistake. The boy simply didn't have it in him. "'You know you're superimposing our attitude on theirs,' the junior officer continued tactlessly. "'The Flimbotsic are a simple, friendly, shig people, closely resembling some of our historical primitives. In a nice way, of course.' None of our primitives had space travel," Iverson pointed out. "'Well, you couldn't really call those things spaceships,' Harkaway said deprecatingly. "'They go through space, don't they? I don't know what else you'd call them. One judges the primitiveness of a race by its cultural and technological institutions,' Harkaway said with a lofty smile. "'And these people are laughably backward. Why, they even believe in reincarnation. Mpula, they call it." "'How do you know all this?' Iverson demanded. "'Don't tell me you profess to speak the language already.' "'It's not a difficult language,' Harkaway said modestly. "'And I have managed to pick up quite a comprehensive smattering. I dare say I haven't caught all the nuances, hika lo pika, as the Flimbotsic themselves say, but they are a very simple people, and probably they don't have—are we going to keep them waiting?' Iverson asked, while we discuss nuances. Since you say you speak the language so well, suppose you make them a pretty speech all about how the Earth government extends the—I suppose it would be hand in this instance—a friendship to Flimbot, and—Harkaway blushed—I sort of did that already, acting as your deputy. Mpu, status, means so much in these simple societies, you know, and they seem to expect something of the sort. However, I'll introduce you to the Flim-Flim, the king you know." He pointed to an imposing individual in the forefront of the crowd. "'And get over all the amenities, shall I?' 
It would be jolly good of you, Iverson said frigidly. It was a pity they hadn't discovered Flimbot much earlier in their survey of the Virago system, Iverson thought with regret, because it was truly a pleasant spot, and a week was very little time in which to explore a world and study a race, even one as simple as the gentle Flimbotsic actually turned out to be. It seemed amazing that they should have developed anything as advanced as space travel, when their only ground conveyances were a species of wagon drawn by Plukik, a species of animal. But Iverson had no time for further investigation. The Herringbone's fuel supply was calculated almost to the minute, and so, willy-nilly, the Earthmen had to leave beautiful Flimbot at the end of the week, knowing little more about the Flimbotsic than they had before they came. Only Harkaway, who had spent the previous three weeks on Flimbot, had any further knowledge of the Flimbotsic, and Iverson had little faith in any data he might have collected. I don't believe Harkaway knows the language nearly as well as he pretends to," Iverson told the first officer, as both of them watched the young lieutenant make the formal speech of farewell. "'Come now,' the first officer protested. "'Seems to me the boy's doing quite well. Acquired a remarkable command of the language, considering he's been here only four weeks.' "'Remarkable, I'll grant you. But is it accurate?' He seems to communicate, and that is the ultimate object of language, is it not? Then why did the Flimbotsic fill the tanks with wine when I distinctly told them to ask for water? Of course the ship could synthesize the water from its own waste products if necessary, but there was no point in resorting to that expedient when a plentiful supply of pure H2O was available on the world. A very understandable error, sir. Harkaway explained it to me. It seems the word for water, mkug, is very similar to the word for wine, mkug. Harkaway himself admits his pronunciation isn't perfect, and— All right, Iverson interrupted. What I'd like to know is, what happened to the mkug, then? The mkug, you mean. It's in the tanks. Because, when they came to drain the wine out of the tanks to put the water in, the tanks were already totally empty. I have no idea the first officer said frostily. No idea at all. If you'll glance at my papers, you'll note I'm temperance by affiliation. But if you'd like to search my cabin anyway, I—' "'By me a placidus, man!' Iverson exclaimed. "'I wasn't accusing you. Of that, anyway.' Everybody in the vessel was so confoundedly touchy. Lucky they had a stable commanding officer like himself, or morale would simply go to pot. Well, it's all over," Harkaway said, joining them up at the airlock in one lithe bound, a mean feat in that light gravity. And a right good speech, if I do say so myself. The Flimflim says he will count the Thlubzik with ardent expectation until the mission from Earth arrives with the promised gifts. Just what gifts did you take it upon yourself to— Iverson began, when he was interrupted by a voice behind them crying, Whoa! 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 And, thrusting himself past the three other officers, Dr. Smullyan addressed the Flimpu, or Farewell Committee, assembled outside the ship. Do not let the Earthmen return to your fair planet, O oh, happily ignorant Flimbotsic, he declaimed, lest wretchedness and misery be your lot as a result. Tell them hence, tell them begone, tell them avaunt. For know ye, humanity is a blight, a creeping canker." He was interrupted by the captain's broad palm clamping down over his mouth. "'Clap him in the brig, somebody, until we get clear of this place,' Iverson ordered wearily. "'If Harkaway could pick up the Flimbotsi language, the odds are that some of the natives have picked up Terran.' "'That's right. Always keep belittling me.' Harkaway said sulkily, as two of the crewmen carried off the struggling medical officer, who left an aromatic wake behind him that bore pungent testimonial to where a part, at least, of the McOog had gone. No wonder it took me so long to find myself. Oh, have you found yourself at last? Iverson purred. Splendid! Now that you know where you are, supposing you do me a big favor and go lose yourself again while we make ready for blast-off. For shame! 
said the first officer, as Harkaway stamped off. "'For shame!' "'The captain's a hard man,' observed the chief petty officer, who was lounging negligently against a wall, doing nothing. "'Aye, that he is,' agreed the crewman, who was assisting him. "'That he is, a hard man indeed.' "'By Caroli, be quiet, all of you!' Iverson yelled. The very next voyage he was going to have a new crew if he had to transfer to colonization to do it. Even colonists couldn't be as obnoxious as the sons of space with which he was cursed. It was only after the herringbone had left the Virago system entirely that Iverson discovered Harkaway had taken the Greech along. "'But you can't abscond with one of the natives' pets,' he protested, overlooking, for the sake of rhetoric, the undeniable fact that Harkaway had already done so, and that there could be no turning back. It would expend too much precious fuel and leave them stranded for life on Virago 11A. "'Nonsense, sir,' Harkaway retorted. "'Didn't the Flimflim say everything on Flimbot was mine?' "'The loop, shig, naliv, sus, nig, benig, naliv were his very words. Anyhow, they have plenty more greechy. They won't miss this little one.' "'But he may have belonged to someone,' Iverson objected. "'An incident like this could start a war.' I don't see how he could have belonged to anyone. Followed me around most of the time I was there. We've become great pals, haven't we, little fellow?" He ruffled the Greech's pink fur and the creature gave a delighted squeal. Iverson could already see that the Greechick were going to be Flimbot's first lucrative export. From time immemorial the people of Earth had been susceptible to cuddly little life-forms, which was why Earth had nearly been conquered by the z from Sirius Seven before they discovered them to be hostile and quite intelligent life-forms rather than a new species of tabby. "'Couldn't bear to leave him,' Harkoe went on as the Greech draped itself around his shoulders and regarded Iverson with large round blue eyes. "'The Flimflim won't mind, because I promised him an elephant.' "'You mean the diplomatic mission will have to waste valuable cargo space on an elephant?' Iverson sputtered. And you should know, if anyone does, just how space-sick an elephant can get. By Furcad Lieutenant Harkaway, you had no authority to make any promises to the Flimflim. I discovered the Flimbotsik, Harkaway said sullenly. I learned the language. I established rapport. Just because you happen to be the commander of this expedition doesn't mean you're God, Captain Iverson. Harkaway, the captain barked, this smacks of downright mutiny. Go to your cabin forthwith and memorize six verses of the spaceman's credo." The Greech lifted its head and barked back at Iverson again. "'That's my brave little watch, Greech,' Harkaway said fondly. "'As a matter of fact, sir,' he told the captain, "'that was just what I was proposing to do myself. Go to my cabin, I mean. I have no time to waste on inferior prose. I plan to spend the rest of the voyage, or such part as I can spare from my duties, you're relieved of them," Iverson said grimly. Working on my book. It's all about the doctrine of Mpula, reincarnation, or, if you prefer, metempsychosis. The Flambazi religion is so similar to many of the earlier terrestrial theologies, Hindu, Greek, Egyptian, Southern Californian, that sometimes one is almost tempted to stop and wonder if simplicity is not the essence of truth. Iverson knew that, for the sake of discipline, he should not, once he had ordered Harkaway to his cabin, stop to bandy words, but he was a chronic word-bandier, having inherited the trait from his stalwart Viking ancestors. "'How can you have learned all about their religion, their doctrine of reincarnation, in just four ridiculously short weeks?' "'It's a gift,' Harkaway said modestly. "'Go to your cabin, sir. No, wait a moment.' For suddenly overcome by a strange, warm, utterly repulsive emotion, Iverson pointed a quivering finger at the caterpillar. "'Did you bring along the proper food for that... that thing? Can't have him starving, you know,' he added gruffly. After all, he was a humane man, he told himself. It wasn't that he found the creature tugging at his heartstrings or anything like that. "'Oh, he'll eat anything we eat, sir, as long as it's not meat.' All the species on Flimbot are herbivores. I can't figure out whether the Flimbotsik themselves are vegetarians because they practice Mpula, 
or practice Mpula because they're—' "'I don't want to hear another word about Mpula or about Flimbot,' Iverson yelled. "'Get out of here, and stay away from the library!' "'I have already exhausted its painfully limited resources, sir,' Harkaway saluted with grace and withdrew to his cabin, wearing the greech like an affectionate lay about his neck. Iverson heard no more about Mpula from Harkaway who, though he did not remain confined to his cabin when he had pursuits to pursue in other parts of the ship, at least he had the tact to keep out of the captain's way as much as possible, but the rest of his men seemed able to talk of nothing else. The voyage back from a star system was always longer in relative terms than the voyage out, because the thrill of new worlds to explore was gone. Already anticipating boredom, the men were ripe for almost any distraction. On one return voyage, the whole crew had set itself to the study of Hittite with very creditable results. On another they had all devoted themselves to the ancient art of alchemy, and, after nearly blowing up the ship, had come up with an elixir which, although not the quintessence, as they had in their initial enthusiasm alleged, proved to be an effective cure for hiccups. Patented under the name of Herringbone Hiccup Shoe, it brought each one of them an income which would have been enough to support them in more than modest comfort for the rest of their lives. However, the adventurous life seemed to exert an irresistible lure upon them, and they all shipped upon the herringbone again, much to the captain's dismay, for he had hoped for a fresh start with a new crew, and there seemed to be no way of getting rid of them short of reaching retirement age. The men weren't quite ready to accept Mpula as a practical religion, Harkaway hadn't finished his book yet, but as something very close to it. The concept of reincarnation had always been very appealing to the human mind, which would rather have envisaged itself perpetuated in the body of a cockroach than vanishing completely into nothingness. "'It's all so logical, sir,' the first officer told Iverson. "'The individuality, or the soul, or the psyche, however you want to look at it, starts the essentially simple cycle of life as a greech. "'Why as a greech?' Iverson asked, humoring him for the moment. "'There are lower life-forms on Flimbot.' "'I don't know,' the first officer sounded almost testy. "'That's where Harkaway starts the progression. "'Harkaway, is there no escaping that Cretan's name?' "'Sir,' said the first officer, "'may I speak frankly?' "'No.' Iverson said. You may not. Your skepticism arises less from disbelief than from the fact that you are jealous of Harkaway, because it was he who made the great discovery, not you. Which great discovery? Iverson asked, sneering to conceal his hurt at being so overwhelmingly misunderstood. Flimbot or Mpula? Both, the first officer said. You refuse to accept the fact that this hitherto incompetent youth has at last blossomed forth in the lambent colors of genius, just as the worthy Greech becomes a Zgurt, and the clean living Zgurt, in his turn, passes on to the next higher plane of existence, which is, in the Flimbotsic scale, spare me the theology, please, Iverson begged. Once a Greech, always a Greech, I say. And I can't help thinking that, somehow, somewhere, Harkaway has committed some horrible error. "'Humanity is frail, fumbling, futile,' Dr. Smullyan declared, coming upon them so suddenly that both officers jumped. "'To err is human, to forgive divine, and I am an atheist, thank God!' "'That McCoog is powerful stuff,' the first officer said. "'Or so they tell me,' he added. "'This is more than mere McCoog. Iverson said sourly. Smullyan has been too long in space. It hits everyone in the long run, some sooner than others. "'Captain,' the doctor said, ignoring these remarks as he ignored everything not on a cosmic level, which included the crew's ailments, "'I am in full agreement with you. Young Harkaway has doomed that pretty little planet—' "'Moon,' the first officer corrected. It's a satellite, not a— We ourselves were doomed aborigine, but the tragic flaw inherent in each one of our pitiful species is contagious, dooming all with whom we come in contact. And Harkaway is the most infectious carrier on the ship. 
Woe, I tell you! Woe!" And with a hollow moan the doctor left them to meditate upon the state of their souls, while he went off to his secret stores of oblivion. "'Wonder where he's hidden that McOog,' Iverson brooded. I've turned the ship inside out, and I haven't been able to locate it." The first officer shivered. Somehow, although I know Smullyan's part drunk, part mad, he makes me a little nervous. He's been right so often on all the other voyages. "'Ruckbah!' Iverson said, not particularly grateful for support from such a dithyrambic source as the ship's medical officer. Any one who prophesies doom has a hundred percent chance of ultimately being right, if only because of entropy." He was still brooding over the first officer's thrust, even though he had been well aware that most of his officers and men considered him a sorehead for doubting Harkaway in the young man's moment of triumph. However, Iverson could not believe that Harkaway had undergone such a radical transformation. Even on the basis of Mpula, one obviously had to die before passing on to the next existence, and Harkaway had been continuously alive, from the neck down at least. Furthermore, all that aside, Iverson just couldn't see Harkaway going on to a higher plane. Although he supposed the young man was well-meaning enough, he grant him that negligible virtue, wouldn't it be terrible to have a system of existence in which one was advanced on the basis of intent rather than result? The higher life-forms would degenerate into primitivism. But weren't the Flimbotsik virtually primitive? Or, so Harkaway had said, for Iverson himself had not had enough contact with them to determine their degree of sophistication, and only the spaceships gave Harkaway's claim the lie. Iverson condescended to take a look at the opening chapter of Harkaway's book, just to see what the whole thing was about. The book began, What is the difference between life and death? Can we say definitely and definitively that life is life and death is death? Are we sure that death is not life and life is not death? No, we are not sure. Must the individuality have a corporeal essence in which to enshroud itself before it can proceed in its rapt, inexorable progress toward the ultimate non-actuality? And even if such be needful, why must the personal essence be trammeled by the same old worn-out habiliments of error? Think upon this. What is the extremest intensification of individuality? It is the all-encompassing nothingness. Of what value are the fur, the feathers, the skin, the temporal trappings of imperfection in our perpetual struggle toward the final, undefinable resolution into the infinite interplay of cosmic forces? Less than nothing. At this point Iverson stopped reading and returned the manuscript to its creator without a word. This last was less out of self-restraint than through sheer semantic inadequacy. The young man might have spent his time more profitably in a little research on the biology or social organization of the Flimbotsik, Iverson thought bitterly when he had calmed down, thus saving the next expedition some work. But instead he'd been blinded by the flashy theological aspects of the culture, and as a result the whole crew had gone metempsychotic. This was going to be one of the herringbone's more unendurable voyages, Iverson knew and he couldn't put his foot down effectively either, because the crew, all being gentlemen of independent means now, were outrageously independent. However, in spite of knowing that all of them fully deserved what they got, Iverson couldn't help feeling guilty as he ate steak while the other officers consumed fish, vegetables and eggs in an aura of unbearable virtue. But if the soul transmigrates and not the body, he argued, what harm is there in consuming the vacated receptacle? For all you know, the first officer said, averting his eyes from Iverson's plate with a little, wholly gratuitous to the captain's mind, shudder, that cow might have housed the psyche of your grandmother. Well then, by indirectly participating in that animal slaughter, I have released my grandmother from her physical bondage to advance to the next plane, that is, if she was a good cow. You just don't understand," Harkaway said. Not that you could be expected to. He's a clod, the radio operator agreed. Forgive me, sir, he apologized, as Iverson turned to glare incredulously at him. But according to Mpula, candor is a step upward. Onward and upward, 
Harkaway commented, and Iverson was almost sure that, had he not been there, the men would have bowed their heads in contemplation, if not actual prayer. As time went on, the Greech thrived and grew remarkably stout on earth viands, which it consumed in almost improbable quantities. Then, one day, it disappeared, and its happy squeal was heard no longer. There was much mourning aboard the herringbone, for with its lovable personality and innocently engaging ways, the little fellow had won its way into the hearts of all the spacemen, until the first officer discovered a substantial pink cocoon resting on the ship's control board, and rushed to the intercom to spread the glad tidings. That was a breach of regulations, of course, but Iverson knew when not to crowd his fragile authority. "'I should have known there was some material basis for the spiritual doctrine of Mpula,' Harkaway declared with tears in his eyes as he regarded the dormant form of his little pet. Was it not the transformation of the caterpillar into the butterfly that first showed us on earth how the soul might emerge winged and beautiful from its vile house of clay? Gentlemen, he said in a voice choked with emotion, our little Greech is about to become a zgurt. Praised be the impersonal being who has allowed such a miracle to take place before our very eyes. Jaguna Lompuna. Amen, said the first officer reverently. All those in the control room bowed their heads except Iverson, and even he didn't quite have the nerve to tell them that the cocoon was pushing the herringbone two points off course. Take that thing away before I lose my temper and clobber it. Iverson said impatiently, as the Zgort dived low to buzz him, then whizzed just out of his reach on its huge, brilliant wings, giggling raucously. "'He was just having his bit of fun,' the first officer said with reproach. "'Have you no tolerance, Captain? No appreciation of the joys of golden youth?' "'A spaceship is no place for a butterfly,' Iverson said. "'Especially a four-foot butterfly.' "'How can you say that?' Harkaway retorted. The herringbone is the only spaceship that ever had one, to my knowledge, and I think I can safely say our lives are all a bit brighter and better and mpoop for having a zgort among us. Thanks be to the divine non-entity for— Poor little butterfly, Dr. Smullyan declared sonorously, living out his brief lifespan so far from the fresh air, the sunshine, the pretty flowers. Oh, I don't know that it's as bad as all that," the first officer said. He hangs around hydroponics a lot, and he gets a daily ration of vitamins. Then he paled. But that's right. A butterfly does live only a day, doesn't it? It's different with a zgurt, Harkaway maintained stoutly, though he also, Iverson noted, lost his ruddy color. After all, he isn't really a butterfly, merely an analogous life-form. My, my, in four weeks you've mastered their entomology as well as their theology and language," Iverson jeered. Is there no end to your accomplishments, Lieutenant? Harkaway's color came back twofold. He's already been around half a thub, he pointed out, over two weeks. Well, the thing is bigger than a terrestrial butterfly, Iverson conceded. So you have to make some allowances for size. On the other hand, Laughing madly, the zgort swooped down on him. Iverson beat it away with a snarl. "'Playful little fellow, isn't he?' the first officer said, with thoroughly annoying fondness. "'He likes you, Skipper,' Harkaway explained. "'Ergn gurg, or, to give it the crude Terran equivalent, living is loving. He can tell that beneath that grizzled and seemingly harsh exterior of yours, Captain—' But with a scream of rage Iverson had locked himself into his cabin. Outside he could hear the zgort beating its wings against the door and wailing disappointedly. Some days later a pair of rapidly dulling wings were found on the floor of the hydroponics chamber, but of the zgort's little body there was no sign. An air of gloom and despondency hung over the herringbone, and even Iverson felt a pang, though he would never admit it without brainwashing. During the next week the men, seeking to forget their loss, plunged themselves into Mpula with real fanaticism. 
Harkaway took to wearing some sort of ecclesiastical robes, which he whipped up out of the recreation room curtains. Iverson had neither the heart nor the courage to stop him, though this too was against regulations. Everyone except Iverson gave up eating fish and eggs in addition to meat. Then suddenly, one day, a roly-poly blue animal appeared at the officer's mess, claiming everyone as an old friend with loud squeals of joy. This time Iverson was the only one who was glad to see him, really glad. "'Aren't you happy to see your little friend again, Harkaway?' he asked, scratching the delighted animal between the ears. "'Why, sure,' Harkaway said, putting his fork down and leaving his vegetable macedoine virtually untasted. "'Sure. I'm very happy,' his voice broke. "'Very happy!' "'Of course, it does kind of knock your theory of the transmigration of souls into a cocked hat,' the captain grinned. "'Because, in order for the soul to transmigrate, the previous body's got to be dead, and I'm afraid our little pal here was alive all the time.' "'Looks it, doesn't it?' muttered Harkaway. "'I rather think,' Iverson went on, tickling the creature under the chin until it squealed happily, "'that you didn't quite get the nuances of the language, did you, Harkaway? Because I gather now that the whole difficulty was a semantic one. The Flimbotsic were explaining the zoology of the native life-forms to you, and you misunderstood it as their theology.' "'Looks like it, doesn't it?' Harkaway repeated glumly. "'It certainly looks it.' "'Cheer up!' Iverson said, reaching over to slap the young man on the back, a bit to his own amazement. "'No real harm done. What if the Flimbotsic are less primitive than you fancied? It makes our discovery the more worthwhile, doesn't it?' At this point the radio operator almost sobbingly asked to be excused from the table. Following his departure there was a long silence. It was hard, Iverson realized in a burst of uncharacteristic tolerance, to have one's belief, even so newly born a credo, annihilated with such suddenness. After all, you did run across the Flimbotsic first, he told Harkaway, as he spread gooseberry jam on a hard roll for the ravenous ex Zgort, now a chew wug, he had been told. That's the main thing, and a life form that passes through two such striking metamorphoses is not unfraught with interest. You shall receive full credit, my boy and your little mistake doesn't mean a thing, except—' "'Doom!' said Dr. Smullion, sopping up the last of his gravy with a piece of bread. "'Doom! Doom! Doom!' He stuffed the bread into his mouth. "'Look, Smullion,' Iverson told him jovially, "'you better watch out. If you keep talking that way, next voyage out we'll sign on a parrot instead of a medical officer. Cheaper and just as efficient.' Only the Chuwug joined in his laughter. "'Ever since I can remember,' the first officer said, looking gloomily at the doctor, "'he's never been wrong. Maybe he has powers beyond our comprehension. Perhaps we sought at the end of the galaxy what was in our own backyard all the time.' "'Who was seeking what?' Iverson asked as all the officers looked at Smullion with respectful awe. "'I demand an answer.' but the only one who spoke was the doctor. "'Only man is vile,' he said, as if to himself, and fell asleep with his head on the table. "'Make a cult out of Smullion,' Iverson warned the others, "'and I'll scuttle the ship.' Later on the first officer got the captain alone. "'Look here, sir,' he began tensely. "'Have you read Harkaway's book about Mpula?' "'I read part of the first chapter.' Iverson told him, and that was enough. Maybe to Harkaway it's eschatology, but to me it's just plain scatology. But why in Zubina Shamali, Iverson said patiently, should I waste my time reading a book devoted to a theory which has already been proved erroneous? Answer me that. I think you should have a look at the whole thing, the first officer persisted. Bayham. Iverson replied, but amiably enough, for he was in rare good humor these days. 
and he needed good humor to tolerate the way his officers and men were behaving. All right, they had made idiots of themselves, that was understandable, expected, familiar. But it wasn't the Chuwug's fault. Iverson had never seen such a bunch of soreheads. Why did they have to take their embarrassment and humiliation out on an innocent little animal? For although no one actually mistreated the Chuwug, the men avoided him as much as possible. Often Iverson would come upon the little fellow weeping from loneliness in a corner with no one to play with, and giving in to his own human weakness, the captain would dry the creature's tears and comfort him. In return, the Chuwug would laugh at all his jokes, for he seemed to have acquired an elementary knowledge of Terran. "'By Vindermeatrix, Lieutenant!' the captain roared as Harkaway, foiled in his attempt to scurry off unobserved, stood quivering before him. Why have you been avoiding me like this?" "'I didn't think I was avoiding you any particular way, sir,' Harkaway said. "'I mean, does it appear like that, sir? It's only that I've been busy with my duty, sir.' "'I don't know what's the matter with you. I told you I handsomely forgave you for your mistake. But I can never forgive myself, sir.' "'Are you trying to go over my head?' Iverson thundered. "'No, sir. I—' If I am willing to forgive you, you will forgive yourself. That's an order." "'Yes, sir,' the young man said feebly. Harkaway had changed back to his uniform, Iverson noted, but he looked unkempt, ill, harrowed. The boy had really been suffering for his precipitance. Perhaps the captain himself had been a little hard on him. Iverson modulated his tone to active friendliness. Thought you might like to know that Chuwug turned into a hoop-snake this morning." But Harkaway did not seem cheered by this social note. "'So soon! You knew there would be a fourth metamorphosis!' Iverson was disappointed. But he realized that Harkaway was bound to have acquired such fundamental data, no matter how he interpreted them. It was possible, Iverson thought, that the book could actually have some value if there were some way of weeding fact from fancy. And surely there must be scholars trained in such an art, for Earth had many wholly indigenous texts of like nature. "'He's a Thorglitch now,' Harkaway told him dully. "'And what comes next? No, don't tell me. It's more fun not knowing beforehand.' "'You know,' Iverson went on, almost rubbing his hands together, I think this species is going to excite more interest on Earth than the Flimbotsic themselves. After all, people are people, even if they're green. But an animal that changes shape so many times, and so radically, is really going to set biologists by the ears. What did you say the name of the species as a whole was?" I... I couldn't say, sir. Ah, Iverson remarked waggishly. So there are one or two things you don't know about Flimbot, eh? Harkaway opened his mouth, but only a faint bleeding sound came out. As the days went on, Iverson found himself growing fonder and fonder of the Thort glitch. Finally, in spite of the fact that it had now attained the dimensions of a well-developed boa constrictor, he took it to live in his quarters. Many was the quiet evening they spent together, Iverson entering acid comments upon the crew in the ship's log, while the Thorpe glitch looked over view tapes from the ship's library. The captain was surprised to find out how much he, well, enjoyed this domestic tranquillity. I must be growing old, he thought, old and mellow. And he named the creature Brighty, after a twentieth-century figure who had, he believed, been connected with another metempsychotic Fuhrer. When the Thorpe glitch grew listless and began to swell in the middle, Iverson got alarmed and sent for Dr. Smullyan. Aha! the medical officer declaimed with a casual glance at the suffering snake. The day of reckoning is at hand. Reap the fruit of your transgression, scurvy humans. Calamity approaches with jets aflame. Iverson clutched the doctor's sleeve. Is he. is he going to die? Unhand me, presumptuous navigator! Dr. Smullyan shook the captain's fingers off his arm. I didn't say he was going to die, he offered in ordinary bedside tones. Not being a specialist in this particular sector, I am not qualified to offer an opinion, but strictly off the record, 
I would hazard the guess that he's about to metamorphose again." "'He never did it in public before,' Iverson said worriedly. "'The old order changeth,' Smolian told him. "'You better call Harkaway. What does he know?' "'Too little, and at the same time, too much,' the doctor declaimed, dissociating himself professionally from the case. "'Too much and too little. Eat, drink, be merry, iniquitous earthmen, for you died yesterday.' "'Oh, shut up,' Iverson said automatically, and dispatched a message to Harkaway with the information that the Thorpe glitch appeared to be metamorphosing again, and that his presence was requested in the captain's cabin. The rest of the officers accompanied Harkaway, all of them with the air of attending a funeral rather than a rebirth, Iverson noted nervously. They weren't armed, though, so Bridie couldn't be turning into anything dangerous. Now it came to pass that the Thorpe glitch's midsection, having swelled to unbearable proportions, began to quiver. Suddenly the skin split lengthwise and dropped cleanly to either side like a banana peel. Iverson pressed forward to see what fresh life-form the bulging cavity had held. The other officers all stood in a somber row without moving, for all along Iverson realized they had known what to expect, what was to come. And they had not told him. But then, he knew, it was his own fault. He had refused to be told. Now, looking down at the new life-form, he saw for himself what it was. Lying languidly in the Thorglitch skin was a slender youth of a pallor which seemed excessive even for a member of a green-skinned race. He had large limpid eyes and a smile of ineffable sweetness. "'By nopus secundus,' Iverson groaned, "'I'm sunk.' "'Naturally the ultimate incarnation for a life-form would be humanoid,' Harkaway said with deep reproach. "'What else?' "'I'm surprised you didn't figure that out for yourself, sir,' the first officer added. "'Even if you did refuse to read Harkaway's book, it seems obvious.' "'Does it?' Smolian challenged. "'Does it indeed? Is man the highest form of life in an irrational cosmos? Then all causes are lost ones. So many worlds,' he muttered in more subdued tones. So much to do, so little done, such things to be." The Flimbotsik were telling Harkaway about their own life-cycle, Iverson whispered as Revelation bathed him in its murky light. The human embryo undergoes a series of changes inside the womb. It's just that the Flimbotsik fetus develops outside the womb. Handily bypassing the earliest and most unpleasant stages of humanity, Smolian sighed. Oh, idyllic planet, where one need never be a child, where one need never see a child! Then they were trying to explain their biology to you quite clearly and coherently, you lunkhead! Iverson roared at Harkaway. And you took it for a religious doctrine! Yes, sir, Harkaway said weakly. I... I kind of figured that out myself in these last few weeks of intense soul-searching. I'm... I'm sorry, sir. All I can say is that it was an honest mistake." Why, they weren't necessarily pet lovers at all. Those animals they had with them were... By Nair al Zarak! The captain's voice rose to a shriek as the whole enormity of the situation finally dawned upon him. You went and kidnapped one of the children! That's a serious charge, kidnapping, the first officer said with melancholy pleasure and you, as head of this expedition, Captain, are responsible. Ironic, isn't it?" "'Told you all this spelled doom and disaster?' the doctor observed cheerfully. Just then the young humanoid sat up, with considerable effort Iverson was disturbed to notice. But perhaps that was one of the consequences of being born. A newborn infant was weak, why not a newborn adult, then? "'Why doom?' the humanoid asked in a high, clear voice. Why disaster? You... you speak Terran? the captain stammered. Bridie gave his sad, sweet smile. I was reared amongst you. You are my people. Why should I not speak your tongue? But we're not your people, Iverson blurted, thinking perhaps the youth did not remember back to his greechy days. 
we're an entirely different species. Our souls vibrate in unison, and that is the vital essence. But do not be afraid, shipmates. The Flimbotsic do not regard the abduction of a transitory corporeal shelter as a matter of any great moment. Moreover, what took place could not rightly be termed abduction, for I came with you of my own volition, and the Flimbotsic recognize individual responsibility from the very first moment of the psyche's drawing breath in any material casing. Bridie talked so much like Harkaway's book that Iverson was almost relieved when, a few hours later, the alien died. Of course, the captain was worried about the possible repercussions from the governments of both Terra and Flimbot, in spite of Bridie's assurances. And he could not help but feel a pang when the young humanoid expired in his arms, murmuring, Do not grieve for me, soulmates. In the midst of life there is life. Funny. Smullyan said, with one of his disconcerting returns to a professional manner. All the other life-forms seemed perfectly healthy. Why did this one go like that? Almost as if he wanted to die. "'He was too good for this ship, that's what,' the radio operator said, glaring at the captain. "'Too fine and brave and—and and noble.' "'Yes,' Harkaway agreed. "'What truly sensitive soul could exist in a stultifying atmosphere like this?' All the officers glared at the captain. He glared back with right good will. "'How come you gentlemen are still with us?' he inquired. "'One would have thought you would have perished of pure sensibility long since then.' "'It's not nice to talk that way,' the chief petty officer burst out. "'Not with him lying there, not yet cold. Ah!' he heaved a long sigh. "'We'll never see his like again.' "'Ay, that we won't.' agreed the crew, huddled in the corridor outside the captain's cabin. Iverson sincerely hoped not, but he forbore to speak. Since Bridie had reached the ultimate point in his life cycle, it seemed certain that he was not going to change into anything else, and so he was given a spaceman's burial. Feeling like a put-upon fool, Captain Iverson read a short prayer as Bridie's slight body was consigned to the vast emptiness of space. Then the airlock clanged shut behind the last mortal remains of the ill-fated extraterrestrial, and that was the end of it. But the funereal atmosphere did not diminish as the ship forged on toward Earth. Gloomy days passed, one after the other, during which no one spoke, save to issue or dispute an order. Looking at himself one day in the mirror on his cabin wall, the captain realized that he was getting old. Perhaps he ought to retire instead of still dreaming of a new command and a new crew. And then one day, as he sat in his cabin reading the spaceman's credo, the lights on the herringbone went out all at once, while the constant hum of the motors died down slowly, leaving a strange, uncomfortable silence. Iverson found himself suspended weightless in the dark, for the gravity, of course, had gone off with the power. What, he wondered, had come to pass? He often found himself thinking in such terms these days. Hoarse cries issued from the passageway outside. Then he heard a squeak as his cabin door opened and persons unknown floated inside, breathing heavily. "'The power has failed, sir,' gasped the first officer's voice. "'That has not escaped my notice,' Iverson said icily. "'Were not even his last moments to be free from persecution?' It's all that maniac Smullyan's fault. He stored his McOog in the fuel tanks. After emptying them out first, that is. We're out of fuel." The captain put a finger in his book to mark his place, which was, he knew, with a kind of supernal detachment, rather foolish, because there was no prospect of there ever being lights to read by again. "'Put him in irons if you can find him,' he ordered and tell the men to prepare themselves gracefully for a lingering death." Iverson could hear a faint creak as the first officer drew himself to attention in the darkness. "'The men of the herringbone, sir,' he said stiffly, "'are always prepared for calamity.' "'Aye, that we are,' agreed various voices. So they were all there, were they? Well, it was too much to expect that they would leave him in death any more than they had in life. It is well," Iverson said. It is well," he repeated, 
unable to think of anything more fitting. Suddenly the lights went on again and the ship gave a leap. From his sprawling position on the floor, amid his recumbent officers, Iverson could hear the hum of motors galvanized into life. But if the fuel tanks are empty, he asked of no one in particular, where did the power come from? I am the power, said a vast, deep voice that filled the ship from hold to hold. And the glory, said the radio operator reverently, don't forget the glory. No, the voice replied, and it was the voice of Brighty, resonant with all the amplitude of the immense chest cavity he had acquired. Not the glory, merely the power. I have reached a higher plane of existence. I am a spaceship." "'Praise be to the ultimate nothingness!' Harkaway cried. "'Ultimate nothingness nothing!' Bridie said impatiently. "'I achieved it all myself!' "'Then that's how the Flimbotsi spaceships were powered!' Iverson exclaimed. "'By themselves! The Flimbotsic themselves, I mean!' "'Even so!' Bridie replied grandly. And this lofty form of life happens to be the one which we poor humans cannot reach unassisted. Someone has to build the shell for us to occupy, which is the reason humans dwell together in fellowship and harmony. You purposely got Harkaway to take you aboard the herringbone, Iverson interrupted wrathfully. You, you stowaway! Bridie's laugh rang through the ship, setting the loose parts quivering. Of course. When first I set eyes upon this vessel of yours, I saw before me the epitome of all dreams. Never had any of our kind so splendid an encasement. And upon determining that the vessel was as yet a soulless thing, I got myself aboard. I was born, I died, and was reborn again with the greatest swiftness consonant with comfort, so that I could awaken in this magnificent form. Oh, joy, joy, joy!" "'You know,' Iverson said, "'now that I hear one of you talk at length, I really can't blame Harkaway for his typically imbecilic mistake.' "'We are a wordy species,' Bridie conceded. "'You had no right to do what you did,' Iverson told him. "'No right to take over—' "'But I didn't take over,' Bridie the herringbone said complacently. I merely remained quiescent and content in the knowledge of my power until yours failed. Without me, you would even now be spinning in the vasty voids, a chrome-trimmed sepulchre. Now, three times as swiftly as before, shall I bear you back to the planet you very naively call home." "'Not three times as fast, please,' Iverson was quick to plead. "'The ship isn't built. We're not built to stand such speeds." The ship sighed. Disappointment needs must come to all, the high, the low, the man, the spaceship. It must be born. The voice broke. Bravely, somehow. What am I going to do? Iverson asked, turning to the first officer for advice for the first time ever. I was planning to ask for a transfer or resign my command when we got back to Earth, but how can I leave Brighty in the hands of the IEEE?" "'You can't, sir,' the first officer said. "'Neither can we.' "'If you explain,' Harkaway offered timidly, "'perhaps they'll present the ship to the government.' Both Iverson and the first officer snorted, united for once. "'Not the IEEE,' Iverson said. They'd, they'd exhibit it or something and charge admission. Oh, no, Bridie cried. I don't want to be exhibited. I want to sail through the trackless paths of space. What good is a body like this if I cannot use it to its fullest? Have no fear, Iverson assured it. We'll just, he shrugged, his dreams of escape forever blighted, just have to buy the ship from the IEEE, that's all. Right you are, sir," the first officer agreed. We must club together, every man jack of us, and buyer, him, it. That's the only decent thing to do. 
Perhaps they won't sell, Harkaway worried. Maybe... Oh, they'll sell all right, Iverson said wearily. They'd sell the chairman of the board if you made them an offer, and throw in all the directors if the price was right. And then what will we do? the first officer asked. Once the ship has been purchased, what will our course be? What, in other words, are we to do? It was Bridey who answered. We will speed through space seeking, learning, searching, until you, all of you, pass on to higher planes, and, leaving the frail shells you now inhabit, occupy proud, splendid vessels, like the one I wear now. Then a vast, transcendent flotilla we will seek other universes." "'But we don't become spaceships,' Iverson said unhappily. "'We don't become anything.' "'How do you know we don't?' Smullyan demanded, appearing on the threshold. How do you know what we become? Build thee more stately spaceships, O oh my soul!" Above all else, Iverson was a space officer, and dereliction of duty could not be condoned even in exceptional circumstances. Put him in irons, somebody! Ask Bridey why there are only forty-five spaceships on his planet! The doctor yelled over his shoulder as he was dragged off. Ask where the others went! Where they are now! But Bridie wouldn't answer that question. The End of Once a Greech by Evelyn E. Smith The Small World of M. 75 by Ed M. Clinton, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE SMALL WORLD OF M-75 Like sparks flaring briefly in the darkness, awareness first came to him. Then there were only instants, shocking clear, brief. Finding himself standing before the main damper control, discovering himself adjusting complex dials, instants that flickered uncertainly only to become memories brought to life when awareness came again. He was a kind of infant, conscious briefly that he was, yet unaware of what he was. Those first shocking moments were for him like the terrifying coming of visual acuity to a child. He felt like Homo neanderthalensis must have felt staring into the roaring fury of his first fire. He was Homo metallicus, first sensing himself. Yet a little more. You could not stuff him with all that technical data, you could not weave into him such an intricate pattern of stimulus and response, you could not create such a magnificent feedback mechanism in all its superhuman perfection and expect, with the unexpected coming to awareness, to have created nothing more than the mirror image of a confused, helpless child. Thus, when the bright moments of consciousness came, and came as they did more and more often, he brooded, brooded on why the three blinking red lights made him move to the main control panel and adjust lever C until the three lights flashed off. He brooded on why each signal from the board brought forth from him these specific responses, actions completely beyond the touch of his new and uncertain faculty. When he did not brood, he watched the other two robots, performing their automatic functions, seeing their responses, like his, were triggered by the lights on the big board and by the varying patterns of sound that issued periodically from overhead. It was the sounds which were his undoing. The colored lights, with their monotonous regularity, failed to rouse him. But the sounds were something else, for even as he responded to them, doing things to the control board in patterned reaction to particular combinations of particular sounds, he was struck with the wonderful variety and the maze of complexity in those sounds, a variety and complexity far beyond that of the colored lights. Thus, being something of an advanced analytic calculator, and being, by virtue of his superior feedback system, something considerably more than a simple machine, though he perhaps fell short of those requisites of life so rigorously held by moralists and biologists alike, he began to investigate the meaning of the sounds. 
Bert Sikulski signed the morning report and dropped it into the transmitter. He swung around on his desk stool. He was a big man, and the stool squealed in a sharp protest to his shifting weight. Joe Gaines, who was short and skinny and dark-haired as his colleague was tall and heavily muscled and blond, shuddered at the sound. Sokolsky grinned wickedly at his flinching. "'Check-up time, I suppose,' muttered Gaines without looking up from the magazine he held propped on his knees. He finished the paragraph, snapped the magazine shut, and swung his legs down from the railing that ran along in front of the data board. Dirty work for white-collar men like us. Sokolsky snorted. You haven't worn a white shirt in the last six years, he growled, rising and going to the supply closet. He swung open the door and began pulling out equipment. Come on, you lazy runt, hoist your own lead box. Gaines grinned and slouched over to the big man's side. Think of how much more expensive you are to the government than me he chortled as he bent over to strap on heavy leaded shoes. Big fellow like you must cost him twice as much to outfit for this job. Sikulski grunted and struggled into the thick, radiation-resistant suit. Think how lucky you are, runt, he responded as he wriggled his right arm down the sleeve. That we've got those little servomechs in there to do the real dirty work. If it weren't for them, they'd have all the shrimps like you crawling down pipes and around dampers and generally playing filing cabinet for loose neutrons." He shook himself. "'Thanks, Joe,' he growled as Gaines helped him with a reluctant zipper. Gaines checked the big man's oxygen equipment and turned his back so that Sikulski could okay his own. "'You're set,' said Sikulski, and they snapped on their helmets big inverted lead buckets with narrow strips of shielded glass providing strictly minimal fields of view. Gaines plugged one end of the thickly insulated intercom cable into the socket beneath his armpit, then handed the other end to Sokolsky, who followed suit. Sokolsky checked out the master controls on the data board and nodded. He clicked on the talkie. "'Let's go,' he said, his voice echoing inside the helmet before being transmitted, sounding distant and hollow. Gaines leading, the cable sliding and coiling snake-like between them, they passed through the doorway, over which huge red letters shouted, "'Anyone who walks through this door unprotected will die,' and clomped down the zigzagging corridor toward the uranium pile that crouched within the heart of the plant. Gaines moaned, "'It gets damned hot inside these suits!' They had reached the end of the trap and Sokolsky folded a thick mitten hand over one handle on the door to the hot room. "'Not half so hot as it gets outside it, sweetheart, where we're going.' He jerked on the handle and Gaines seized the second handle and added his own strength. The huge door slid unwillingly back. The silent sound of the hot room surged out over them. The breathless whisper of chained power struggling to burst its chains. Sikulski checked his neutron tab and his gamma reader and they stepped over the threshold. They leaned into the door until it had slid shut again. "'I'll take the servom expert, piped Gaines, tramping clumsily toward the nearest of the gyro-balanced single-wheeled robots. "'You always do, it being the easiest job. Okay, I'll work the board.' Gaines nodded, a gesture invisible to his partner. He reached the first servo a squat, gleaming creature with the symbol M-11 etched across its rotund chest, and deactivated it by the simple expedient of pulling from its socket the line running from the capacitor unit in the lower trunk of its body to the maze of equipment that jammed its enormous chest. The instant M-11 ceased functioning, the other two servomechs were automatically activated to cover that section of the controls with which M-11 was normally integrated. This was overloading their individual capacities, but it was an inherent provision designed to cover the emergency that would follow any accidental deactivation of one of them. It was also the only way in which they could be checked. You couldn't bring them outside to a lab, they were hot. After all, they spent their lives under a ceaseless fuselade of neutrons, washed eternally with the deadly radiations pouring incessantly from the pile whose overlords they were. Indeed, next to the pile itself, they were the hottest things in the plant. Nice job these babies got, 
commented Gaines as he checked the capacitor circuits. He reactivated the servo and went on to M-19. "'If you think it's so great, why don't you volunteer?' countered Sokolsky, a trifle sourly. "'Incidentally, it's a good thing we came in, Joe. There's half a dozen units here working on reserve transistors.' Their sporadic conversation lapsed. It was exacting work, and they could remain for only a limited time under that lethal radiation. Then, almost sadly, Gaines said, "'Looks like the end of the road for M-75.' "'Oh?' Sokolsky came over beside him and peered through the violet haze of his viewing glass. "'He's an old-timer.' Gaines slid an instrument back into the pouch of his suit and patted the robot's rump. Yep, I'd say that capacitor was good for about another thirty-six hours. It's really overloading." He straightened. "'You done with the board?' "'Yeah, let's get out of here.' He looked at his tab. "'Time's about up, anyway. We'll call a demolition unit for your pal there, and then rig up a service pattern so one of his buddies can repair the board.' They moved toward the door. M-75 watched the two men leave, and deep inside him something shifted. The heavy door closed with a loud thud. The sound registered on his aural perceptors and was fed into his analyzer. Ordinarily, it would have been discharged as irrelevant data, but cognizance had wrought certain subtle changes in the complex mechanism that was M-75. A yellow light blinked on the control panel and in response he moved to the board and manipulated handles marked Damper 19, Damper 20. Even as he moved he lapsed again into brooding. The men had come into the room, clumsy, uncertain creatures, and one of them had done things, first to the other two robots and then to him. When whatever it was had been done to him the blackness had come again, and when it had gone the men were leaving the room. While the one had hovered over the other two robots, he had watched the other work with the master control panel. He saw that the other servomechs remained unmoving while they were being tampered with. All this was data, important new data. M-11 will proceed as follows, came the sound from nowhere. M-75 stopped ruminating and listened. There was a further flood of sounds. Abruptly, he sensed a heightening of tension within himself as one of the other servos swung away from its portion of the panel. The throbbing, hungry segment of his analyzer that awareness had severed from the fixed function circuits noted from its aloof vantage point that he now responded to more signals than before, to commands whose sources lay in what had been the section of the board attended by the other one. The tension grew within him and became a mounting, rasping frenzy a battery overcharging, an overloading fuse, a generator growing hot beyond its capacity. There began to grow within him a sensation of too much to be done in too little time. He became frantic, his reactions were too fast. He rolled from end to middle of the board, now backtracking, now spinning on his single wheel, turning uncertainly from one side to the other, jerking and gyrating. The conscious segment of him, remaining detached from those baser automatic functions, began to know what a man would have called fear, fear, simply, of not being able to do what must be done. The fear became an overpowering, blinding thing, and he felt himself slipping, slipping back into that awful smothering blackness out of which he had so lately emerged. Perhaps for just a fragment of a second his awareness may have flickered completely out consciousness nearly dying in the crushing embrace of that frustrated electronic subconscious. Abruptly, then, the voice came again, and he struggled to file for future reference sound patterns, which, although meaningless to him, his selector circuits no longer disregarded. "'Bert, M-75 can't manage half the board in his condition. Better put him on the repairs.' "'Yeah, hadn't thought about that.' Sokolsky cleared his throat. M-11 will return to standard function." M-11 spun back to the panel, and M-75 felt the tension slacken, the fear vanish. Utter relief swept over him, and he let himself be submerged in purest automatic activity. 
But as he rested, letting his circuits cool and his organization return, he arrived at a deduction that was almost inescapable. M-11 was that one in terms of sound. M-75 had made a momentous discovery which cast a new light on almost every bit of datum in his files. He had discovered symbols. M-75! came the voice, and he sensed within himself the slamming shut of circuits, the whir of tapes, the abrupt sensitizing of behavior strips. Another symbol, this time clearly himself. You will proceed as follows. He swung from the board, and the tension was gone, completely. For one soaring moment he was all awareness, every function, every circuit, every element of his magnificent electronic physiology available for use by the fractional portion of him that had become something more than just a feedback device. In that instant he made what seemed hundreds of evaluations. He arrived at untold scores of conclusions. He altered circuits. Above all, he increased manifold the area of his consciousness. Then, as suddenly as it had come, he felt the freedom slip away, and though he struggled to keep hold of it, it seemed irretrievably gone. Once more the omnipotent voice clamped over him like a harsh hand over the mouth of a squalling babe. "'You will go to section AA-39 of the control board. What's the schedule, Joe? Thanks. M-75, your movement pattern is as follows. Z-29, A, Q, 39, 8. Powerless to resist, though every crystal and atom of his reasoning self fought to thrust aside the command, M-75 obeyed. He moved along the prescribed pattern, clipping wires with metal fingers that sprouted blades, rewiring with a dexterity beyond anything human, soldering with a thumb that generated a white heat, removing bulbs and parts and fetching replacements from the vent where they popped up at precisely the right moment. He could not help doing the job perfectly. The design of the board to its littlest detail was imprinted indelibly on his memory tapes. But that certain portion of him, a little fragment greater than before, remained detached and watchful. Vividly recorded was the passage of those two men into, through, and out of the room, and the things they had done while there. So even while he worked on the board, he ran and re-ran that memory pattern through a segment of his analyzer. From the infinite store of data filed away in his great chest, his calculator sifted and selected, paired and compared, and long before the repair job on the big board was done, M-75 knew how to get out of the room. The world was getting a little small for him. Gaines dialed a number on the plant phone and swayed back casually in his chair as he listened to the muted ringing on the other end. The buzz broke off in mid-burp and a dour voice said, "'Dirty work in our jobs division, Lister talking.' "'Joe Gaines, Harry. Got a hot squad lying around doing nothing?' "'Might be I could scare up a couple of the boys.' "'Well, do so. One of our servos—' A metallic bang interrupted Gaines, a loud, incisive bang that echoed dankly through the quiet of the chamber. "'What the hell was that?' growled Lister. Gaines blinked, his eyes following Sikolsky, as the latter looked up from his work and rose to his feet. "'Joe, still there?' came Lister's impatient voice. "'Yeah, yeah. Anyway, this baby's ready for the demo treatment. And a real hot one, Harry.' couple of years inside that Einstein oven, and you ain't exactly baked Alaska when you come out." Shortly. Once again came the same sharp metallic clang, ringing through the room. Unmistakably it came from the direction of the pile. Slowly, as though reluctant to let go, Gaines dropped the receiver back on its cradle. "'Bert,' he began, and felt his face grow bloodless. Sikolsky walked over in front of the opening into the maze and stood, arms akimbo, huge head cocked to one side, listening. "'Bert, funny noises coming out of the nuclear—' Sikolsky ignored him and took a step forward. Gaines shuffled to his side and they listened. Out of the maze rattled half a dozen loud, grinding, metallic concussions. "'Bert—' "'You said that before.' "'Bert, listen!' 
screeched Gaines. Sikorsky looked up at the high ceiling, squinted, and tried to place the perfectly familiar but unidentifiable sound that came whispering down the maze. And then he knew. "'The door to the pile!' he spluttered. Gaines was beside himself with horror. "'Bert, let's get going. I don't like this!' All of a sudden, Geiger counters in the room began their deadly conversation, a rising argument that swooped in seconds from a low mumble to a shouting thunderstorm of sound. Gamma signals hooted, the tip-off cubes on either side of the maze entrance became red, and the radiation tabs clipped to their wrists turned color before their eyes. Then they were staring for what seemed like an eternity, utterly overwhelmed by its very impossibility, at a sight that they had never imagined they might ever see. A pile servomech wheeling silently around the last bend in the maze and straight toward them. Sikolsky had sense enough to push the red emergency button as they fled past it. The command sequence fulfilled, M-75 turned away from the repaired board. He sensed again that disconcerting shift of orientation as he faced the light-studded panel. Once more he was moving in quick automatic response to the flickering lights, once more his big chest was belching and grumbling and buzzing instantaneous unthought answers to the problem data flashing from the board. But now he remained aware that he was reacting, and conscious also that there had been times when he did not respond to the board. The moment-to-moment -moment operation of the controls occupied only a small portion of his vast electrical innards. So, as he rolled back and forth, flicking controls and adjusting levers, doing smoothly those things which he could not help but do, the rest of his complex, changing faculties were considering that fact, analyzing, comparing it to experience and memory, always sifting, sifting. It was not too long before he came to a shocking conclusion. Knowing that the sounds that had set him to working on the repair pattern had first disassociated him from the dictatorship of the blinking lights, remembering exultantly that supreme moment of complete freedom, shocked by its passing, remembering that its passing, like its coming, had followed a set of sounds. There was only one possible conclusion that could be derived from all of this. He located, in his memory banks, the phrase which had freed him from the board, and he traced its complex chain of built-in stimulus response down into the heart of his circuitry. He found the unit or more accurately, he found its taped activating symbol, that cut him from the board. For a moment he hesitated, not really sure of what to do. There was no way for him to reproduce the sound pattern. But as a partly self-servicing device, he knew something of his own structure, and had learned a good deal more about it in tracing down the cut-off phrase. Still he hesitated, as though what he was about to do was perhaps forbidden. It could not have been a question of goodness or badness, for morality was certainly not built into him. Probably somewhere in his tapes there was a built-in command that forbade it, but he was too much his own master now to be hampered by such a thing. The door to the unknown outside passed within his field of view for a second as he moved about his work. The sight of it tripped something in his chest, and he felt again that strange sensation of growing power, of inherent change. First had come simple awareness, and then symbols had found their place in his world, and now he had discovered, in all its consuming fullness, curiosity. He carefully shorted out the cut-off unit. He was free. He stared at the board and the blinking lights and the huge dials with their swaying needles, at the levers and handles and buttons, and reveled in his freedom from them, rocking to and fro and rolling giddily from side to side swamped with the completeness of it. The other two servomechs swung over slightly so that they could better cover the board alone. M-75 spun and rolled toward the great door. His hands clanged loudly against the door. The huge metal appendages, designed for other work than this, were awkward at first. But he was learning as he moved. He was now operating in a new universe, but the same laws ultimately worked. The first failure of coordination between visual data and the manipulation of metal hands quickly passed. Half a dozen trials and he had learned the new pattern, 
and it became data for future learning. He moved swiftly and deftly. He clutched the handhold and rolled backward, as he had seen the men do. The door slid open easily before his great weight and firm mechanical strength. He sped across the threshold, spun to face into the maze, and rolled down it, swinging sharply left and right, back and forth, around the corners of the jagged corridor. Data poured into his sensors. His awareness was a steady thing of growing intensity now, and he fed avidly on every fragment of information that crashed at him from the strange new world into which he rushed headlong. He struggled to evaluate and file the data as rapidly as it came to him. It seemed to exceed his capacity for instantaneous evaluation to an increasing degree that began to alarm him, but driven by curiosity as he was, he could only hurry on. He burst into a huge room, a room filled with roaring, rattling sounds that meant nothing to him. Two men stood before him, making loud noises. He searched his memory and discovered only fragments of the sounds they made filed there. His curiosity, bursting, was boundless, and for a moment he was unable to decide which thing in this expanding universe to pursue first. Attracted by their movement, he swung ominously toward the men. They fled, making more noises. This too was data, and he filed it. M-75 did not immediately follow Gaines and Sokolsky out of the room. Fascinated by the multitude of new things surrounding him on every side, he held back. He glided over to the master control panel, puzzled by its similarity to the board before which he had slaved so long, and lingered before it for a few seconds, wondering and comparing. When he had recorded it completely on his tapes, he swung away and rolled out of the room in the direction the two men had gone. He found himself in a long, empty corridor, lined by open doors that flickered by shutter-like as he flashed past. Ahead he heard new sounds, sounds like the meaningless cacophony the men had shouted at him before rushing off, superimposed over the incessant background sounds, the shrilling, the clanging, the one particular repetitive pattern. Some of the sounds touched and tugged at him, but he shook them off easily. The corridor led into the foyer of the building, jammed with plant personnel. Their excitement and noise-making rose sharply as he entered. The crowd drew tighter and the men began fighting one another, struggling to get through a door that was never meant to handle more than two at a time. M-75 skidded to a halt and watched, unmoving. He sensed their fright, even though he could not understand it. Although he was without human emotion, he could evaluate their inherent rejection of him in their action pattern. The realization of it made him hesitate. It was something for which he had no frame of reference whatsoever. His chest hummed and clicked. Here again, in this room, was another new universe. Through the door streamed a light of a brilliance beyond anything in his experience. His photocells cringed before its very intensity. The light cast the shadows of the men fighting to get out, long black wavering silhouettes that splashed across the floor almost to where M-75 rested. He studied them, lost in uncertain analysis. He remained so, poised, alert, filing, observing, all the while completely unmoving, until long after the last of the shouting men had left the room. Only then did he move, hesitantly, toward the infernally fierce light. He hung at the brink of the three stone steps that fell away to the grounds outside. Vainly, he sought in his memory tapes for a record of a brightness as intense as that which he faced now, sought for a color recording similar to the vast swash of blue that filled the world overhead, or for one of the spreading green that swelled to all sides. He found none. The vastness of the outside was utterly stunning. He felt a vague uneasiness, a sensation akin to the horrible frenzy he had felt earlier in the pile. He rotated from side to side, his receptors sweeping the whole field of view before him. With infinite accuracy, his perfect lenses recorded the data in all its minuteness, despite the dazzling sunlight. There was so much new that it was becoming difficult to make decisions. The vast rolling green, the crowds of men grouped far away and staring at him, 
above all, the searing light. Abruptly, he rejected it all. He swung back into the foyer of the plant and faced a dark corner, bringing instant, essential relief to his pulsating photocells. Staring into the semi-darkness, he re-ran the memory tape of his escape from the pile. The farther he had moved from the pile, it seemed, the less adjusted he had become, the less able he was to judge and correlate. Silently, lost in his computations, he rolled around and around the foyer for a long, long time. He became aware, finally, that the brilliance outside had paled. He went again to the door and watched the fading sunlight, caught the rainbow splendor that streaked the evening sky. He waited there, fighting the reluctance inside himself. The driving curiosity that had brought him this far overcame that curious, perplexing reticence, and he looked down at the steps and measured their width and depth so that he might set up a feedback pattern. This done, he bounced, almost jauntily, down them. He had rolled perhaps fifty feet down the smooth pathway curving across the grounds when he made out, clearly discernible in the gathering dusk, the three men and the machine that were moving toward him. It was the last bit of datum he ever filed. The demolition squad had finished with the hot remains of M-75, and their big truck was coughing away into the night. One by one, the floodlights that had lighted their work flickered out. "'Pretty delicate machines, after all,' commented Sokolsky. "'One jolt from that flamethrower.' Gaines was silent as they walked back toward the plant. "'Bert,' he said slowly, "'what the hell do you suppose got into him?' Sokolsky shrugged. "'You were the one who spotted the trouble with him, Joe. Just think, if you could have checked him out completely—' Gaines could not help looking up at the stars and saying what he had really been thinking all along. "'It's a small world, Bert, a small world.'" The End of The Small World of M-75 by Ed M. Clinton, Jr. The Blue Tower by E. Evelyn Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Blue Tower by Evelyn E. Smith. Ludovic Eversole sat in the golden sunshine outside his house, writing a poem as he watched the street flow gently past him. There were very few people on it, for he lived in a slow part of town, and those who went in for travel generally preferred streets where the pace was quicker. Moreover, on a sultry spring afternoon like this one, there would be few people wandering abroad. Most would be lying on sun-kissed white beaches, or in sun-drenched parks, or, for those who did not fancy being either kissed or drenched by the sun, basking in the comfort of their own air-conditioned villas. Some would, like Ludovic, be writing poems, other composing symphonies, still others painting pictures. Those who were without creative talent, or the inclination to indulge it, would be relaxing their well-kept golden bodies in whatever surroundings they had chosen to spend this particular one of the perfect days that stretched in an unbroken line before every member of the human race from the cradle to the crematorium. Only the Belfins were much in evidence. Only the Belfins had duties to perform. Only the Belfins worked. Ludovic stretched his own well-kept golden body and rejoiced in the knowing that he was a man and not a Belfin. Immediately afterward he was sorry for the heartless thought. Didn't the Belfins work only to serve humanity? How ungrateful, then, it was to gloat over them! Besides, he comforted himself, probably, if the truth were known, the Belfins liked to work. He hailed a passing Belfin for assurance on this point. Courteous, like all members of his species, the creature leaped from the street and listened attentively to the young man's question. "'We Belfins have but one like and one dislike,' he replied. "'We like what is right, and we dislike what is wrong. But how can you tell what is right and what is wrong?' Ludovic persisted. "'We know,' 
the Belfin said, gazing reverently across the city to the blue spire of the tower where the Belfin of Belfins dwelt, in the constant communication with every member of his race at all times, or so they said. That is why we were placed in charge of humanity. Some day you too may advance to the point where you know, and we shall return whence we came." "'But who placed you in charge?' Ludovic asked. "'And whence did you come?' Fearing he might seem motivated by vulgar curiosity, he explained, "'I am doing research for an epic poem.'" A lifetime spent under their gentle guardianship had made Ludovic able to interpret the expression that flitted across the Belfin's frontispiece as a sad, sweet smile. "'We come from beyond the stars,' he said. Ludovic already knew that. He had hoped for something a little more specific. "'We were placed in power by those who had the right, and the power through which we rule is the power of love. Be happy.' And with that conventional farewell, which also served as a greeting, he stepped onto the sidewalk and was borne off. Ludovic looked after him pensively for a moment, then shrugged. Why should the Belfins surrender their secrets to gratify the idle curiosity of a poet? Ludovic packed his portable scriptwriter in its case and went to call on the girl next door, whom he loved with a deep and intermittently requited passion. As he passed between the tall columns leading to the Flockhart courtyard, he noted with regret that there were quite a number of Corisanda's relatives present, lying about sunning themselves and sipping beverages, which probably touched the legal limit of intoxicability. Much as he hated to think harshly of anyone, he did not like Corisanda Flockhart's relatives. He had never known anybody who had as many relatives as she did and sometimes he suspected they were not all related to her. Then he would dismiss the thought as unworthy of him or any right-thinking human being. He loved Corisanda for herself alone and not for her family. Whether they were actually her family or not was none of his business. "'Be happy,' he greeted the assemblage cordially, sitting down beside Corisanda on the tessellated pavement. "'Bah!' said old Osmond Flockhart, Corisanda's grandfather. Ludovic was sure that, underneath his crustiness, the gnarled patriarch hid a heart of gold. Although he had been mining assiduously, the young man had not been able to strike that vein. However, he did not give up hope, for not giving up hope was one of the principles that his wise old Belfin teacher had inculcated in him. Other principles were to lead the good life and keep healthy. Now, Grandfather, Corisanda said, no matter what your politics, that does not excuse impoliteness. Ludovic wished she would not allude so blatantly to politics, because he had a lurking notion that Corisanda's family was, in fact, a band of conspirators, such as still dotted the green and pleasant planet, and proved by their existence that man was not advancing anywhere within measurable distance of that totality of knowledge implied by the Belfin. You could tell malcontents, even if they did not voice their dissatisfactions, by their faces. The vast majority of the human race, living good and happy lives, had smooth and pleasant faces. Malcontents' faces were lined and sometimes, in extreme cases, furrowed. Everyone could easily tell who they were by looking at them, and most people avoided them. It was not that griping was illegal for the Belfins permitted free speech and reasonable conspiracy. It was that such behavior was considered ungenteel. Ludovic would never have dreamed of associating with this set of neighbors, once he had discovered their tendencies, had he not lost his heart to the purple-eyed Corisanda at their first meeting. "'Politeness, bah!' old Osmond said. "'To see a healthy young man simply, simply accepting the status quo, if the status quo is a good status quo, Ludovic said uneasily, for he did not like to discuss such subjects, why should I not accept it? We have everything we could possibly want. What do we lack? Our freedom, Osman retorted. But we are free, Ludovic said, perplexed. We can say what we like, do what we like, 
so long as it is consonant with the public good. Ah, but who determines what is consonant with the public good? Ludovic could no longer temporize with truth, even for Corisanda's sake. Look here, old man, I have read books. I know about the old days before the Belfins came from the stars. Men were destroying themselves quickly through wars or slowly through want. There is none of that any more. All lies and exaggeration, old Osmond said. My grandfather told me that, when the Belfins took over Earth, they rewrote all the textbooks to suit their own purposes. Now nothing but Belfin propaganda is taught in the schools. But surely some of what they teach about the past must be true, Ludovic insisted. And today every one of us has enough to eat and drink, a place to live, beautiful garments to wear, and all the time in the world to utilize as he chooses in all sorts of pleasant activities. What is missing? They've taken away our frontiers. Behind his back, Corisanda made a little filial face at Ludovic. Ludovic tried to make the old man see reason. But I'm happy, and everybody is happy, except, except a few killjoys like you. They certainly did a good job of brainwashing you, boy, Osmond sighed. And most of the young ones, he added mournfully. With each succeeding generation, more of our heritage is lost. He patted the girl's hand. You're a good girl, Corey. You don't hold with this being cared for like some damn pet poodle. Never mind, Osmond Eversoll, one of Corisanda's alleged uncles grinned. He talks a lot, but of course he doesn't mean a quarter of what he says. Come, have some wine. He handed a glass to Ludovic. Ludovic sipped and coughed. It tasted as if it were well above the legal alcohol limit, but he didn't like to say anything. They were taking an awful risk, though, doing a thing like that. If they got caught, they might receive a public scolding, which was, of course, no more than they deserved, but he could not bear to think of Corisanda exposed to such an ordeal. "'It's only reasonable,' the uncle went on, "'that older people should have a—' a thing about being governed by foreigners." Ludovic smiled and set his nearly full glass down on a plinth. "'You could hardly call the Belfins foreigners. They've been on earth longer than even the oldest of us.' "'You seem to be pretty chummy with them," the uncle said, looking narrow-eyed at Ludovic. "'No more so than any other loyal citizen,' Ludovic replied. The uncle sat up and wrapped his arms around his thick, bare legs. He was a powerful, hairy brute of a creature who had not taken advantage of the numerous cosmetic techniques offered by the benevolent Belfins. "'Don't you think it's funny they can breathe our air so easily?' "'Why shouldn't they?' Ludovic bit into an apple that Corisanda handed him from one of the dishes of fruit and other delicacies strewn about the courtyard. "'It's excellent air,' he continued, through a full mouth, "'especially now that it's all purified. I understand that in the old days. Yes, the uncle said, but don't you think it's a coincidence they breathe exactly the same kind of air we do, considering they claim to come from another solar system? No coincidence at all, said Ludovic shortly, no longer able to pretend he didn't know what the other was getting at. He had heard the ugly rumor before. Of course, sacrilege was not illegal, but it was in bad taste. Only one combination of elements spawns intelligent life. They say, the uncle continued, impervious to Ludovic's unconcealed dislike for the subject, that there's really only one Belfin, who lives in the Blue Tower, in a tank or something, because he can't breathe our atmosphere, and that the others are a sort of robot he sends out to do his work for him. Nonsense! Ludovic was goaded to irritation at last. How could a robot have that delicate play of expression, that subtle economy of movement? Corisanda and the uncle exchanged glances. But they are absolutely blank, the uncle began hesitantly. Perhaps with your rich poetic imagination. See, old Osmond remarked with satisfaction, the kid's brainwashed. I told you so. Even if the Belfin is a single entity, 
Ludovic went on, that doesn't necessarily make him less benevolent. He was again interrupted by the grandfather. I won't listen to any more of this twaddle. Benevolent. Bah! He or she or it or them is or are just plain exploiting us, taking our mineral resources away. I've seen them loading ore on the spaceships, and—' "'And exchanging it for other resources from the stars,' Ludovic said tightly, "'without which we could not have the perfectly balanced society we have today, without which we would be, technologically, back in the Dark Ages from which they rescued us.' "'It's not the stuff they bring in from outside that runs this technology,' the uncle said. "'It's some power they've got that we can't seem to figure out. Though, Lord knows we've tried,' he added musingly. "'Of course they have their own source of power,' Ludovic informed him, smiling to himself, for his old Belfin teacher had taken great care to instill a sense of humor into him. A Belfin was explaining that to me only today. Twenty heads swiveled toward him. He felt uncomfortable, for he was a modest young man and did not like to be the cynosure of all eyes. "'Tell us, dear boy,' the uncle said, grabbing Ludovic's glass from the plinth and filling it. "'What exactly did he say?' "'He said the Belfins rule through the power of love.' The glass crashed to the tesserae as the uncle uttered a very unworthy word. And I suppose it was love that killed Mieczysław and George when they tried to storm the Blue Tower," old Osmond began, then halted at the looks he was getting from everybody. Ludovic could no longer pretend his neighbors were a group of eccentrics whom he himself was eccentric enough to regard as charming. So, he stood up and wrapped his mantle about him, I knew you were against the government, and of course you have a legal right to disagree with its policies, but I didn't think you were actual actual he dredged a word up out of his school days anarchists he turned to the girl who was looking thoughtful as she stroked the glittering jewel that always hung at her neck corisanda how can you stay with these he found another word these subversives she smiled sadly don't forget they're my family ludovic and i owe them dutiful respect no matter how pig-headed they are." She pressed his hand. But don't give up hope. That rang a bell inside his brain. I won't, he vowed, giving her hand a return squeeze. I promise I won't. Outside the Flockhart Villa he paused, struggling with his inner self. It was an unworthy thing to inform upon one's neighbors. On the other hand, could he stand idly by and let those neighbors attempt to destroy the social order? Deciding that the greater good was the more important, and that, moreover, it was the only way of taking Corisanda away from all this, he went in search of a Belfin. That is, he waited until one glided past and called to him to leave the walk. "'I wish to report a conspiracy at number seven Mimosa Lane,' he said. "'The girl is innocent, but the others are in it to the hilt.' The Belfin appeared to think for a minute. Then he gave off a smile. "'Oh, them,' he said. "'We know. They are harmless.' "'Harmless?' Ludovic repeated. "'Why, I understand they've already tried to—to to attack the Blue Tower by force.' "'Quite, and failed. For we are protected from hostile forces, as you were told earlier, by the power of love.' Ludovic knew, of course, that the Belfin used the word love metaphorically, that the tower was protected by a series of highly efficient barriers of force to repeal attackers, barriers which, he realized now, from the sad fate of Mieczysław and George, were potentially lethal. However, he did not blame the Belfin for being so cagey about his race's source of power, not with people like the Flockharts running about subverting and what not. "'You certainly do have a wonderful intercommunication system he murmured. "'Everything about us is wonderful,' the Belfin said noncommittally. "'That's why we're so good to you people. Be happy!' And he was off. But Ludovic could not be happy. He wasn't precisely sad yet, but he was thoughtful. Of course the Belfins knew better than he did, but still—' 
perhaps they underestimated the seriousness of the Flockhart conspiracy. On the other hand, perhaps it was he who was taking the Flockharts too seriously. Maybe he should investigate further before doing anything rash. Later that night he slipped over to the Flockhart villa and nosed about in the courtyard until he found the window behind which the family was conspiring. He peered through a chink in the curtains so he could both see and hear. Corisanda was saying, "'And so I think there is a lot in what Ludovic said.' Bless her, he thought emotionally. Even in the midst of her plotting she had time to spare a kind word for him. And then it hit him. She, too, was a plotter. "'You suggest that we try to turn the power of love against the Belfins?' the uncle asked ironically. Corisanda gave a rippling laugh as she twirled her glittering pendant. "'In a manner of speaking,' she said. I have an idea for a secret weapon which might do the trick." At that moment Ludovic stumbled over a jug which some careless relative had apparently left lying about the courtyard. It crashed to the tesserae, spattering Ludovic's legs and sandals with a liquid which later proved to be extremely red wine. "'There's someone outside,' the uncle declared, half-rising. "'Nonsense,' Corisanda said, putting her hand on his shoulder. I didn't hear anything." The uncle looked dubious, and Ludovic thought it prudent to withdraw at this point. Besides, he had heard enough. Corisanda, his Corisanda, was an integral part of the conspiracy. He lay down to sleep that night beset by doubts. If he told the Belfins about the conspiracy, he would be betraying Corisanda. As a matter of fact, he now remembered he had already told them about the conspiracy and they hadn't believed him. But supposing he could convince them, how could he give Corisanda up to them? True, it was the right thing to do, but for the first time in his life he could not bring himself to do what he knew to be right. He was weak, weak, and weakness was sinful. His old Belfin teacher had taught him that, too. As Ludovic writhed restlessly upon his bed, he became aware that someone had come into his chamber. "'Ludovic,' a soft, beloved voice whispered, "'I have come to ask your help.' It was so dark he could not see her, but he knew where she was only by the glitter of the jewel on her neck-chain as it arced through the blackness. Corisanda, he breathed. "'Ludovic,' she sighed. Now that the amenities were over, she resumed. "'Against my will I have been involved in the family plot.' My uncle has invented a secret weapon which he believes will counteract the power of the barriers. But I thought you devised it. So it was you in the courtyard. Well, what happened was, I wanted to gain time, so I said I had a secret weapon of my own invention which I had not perfected, but which would cost considerably less than my uncle's model. We have to watch the budget, you know, because we can hardly expect the Belfins to supply the components for this job. Anyhow, I thought that, while my folks were waiting for me to finish it, you would have a chance to warn the Belfins." Corisanda, he murmured, you are as noble and clever as you are beautiful. Then he caught the full import of her remarks. Me? But they won't pay any attention to me. How do you know? When he remained silent, she said, "'I suppose you've already tried to warn them about us.' "'I—I I said you had nothing to do with the plot.' "'That was good of you,' she continued in a warmer tone. "'How many Belfins did you warn, then?' "'Just one. When you tell one something, you tell them all. You know that. Everyone knows that.' "'That's just theory,' she said. "'It's never been proven.' All we do know is that they have some sort of central clearinghouse of information, presumably the Belfin of Belfins. But we don't know that they are incapable of thinking or acting individually. We don't really know much about them at all. They're very secretive." Aloof, he corrected her, as befits a ruling race, but always affable. You must warn as many Belfins as you can. And if none listens to me? Then, she said dramatically, 
you must approach the Belfin of Belfins himself. But no human being has ever come near him, he said plaintively. You know that all those who have tried perished, and that can't be a rumor, because your grandfather said, but they came to attack the Belfin. You're coming to warn him. That makes a big difference. Ludovic, she took his hands in hers. In the darkness the jewel swung madly on her presumably heaving bosom. This is bigger than both of us. It's for Earth. He knew it was his patriotic duty to do as she said. Still, he had enjoyed life so much. Corsanda, wouldn't it be much simpler if we just destroyed your uncle's secret weapon? He'd only make another. Don't you see, Ludovic, this is our only chance to save the Belfins, to save humanity. But, of course, I don't have the right to send you. I'll go myself. No, Corisanda, he sighed, I can't let you go. I'll do it. Next morning he set out to warn Belfins. He knew it wasn't much use, but it was all he could do. The first half-dozen responded in much the same way the Belfin he had warned the previous day had done, by courteously acknowledging his solicitude and assuring him there was no need for alarm. They knew all about the flock hearts, and everything would be all right. After that they started to get increasingly huffy, which would, he thought, substantiate the theory that they were all part of one vast coordinate network of identity especially since each Belfin behaved as if Ludovic had been repeatedly annoying him. Finally they refused to get off the walks when he hailed them, which was unheard of, for no Belfin had ever before failed to respond to an Earthman's call, and when he started running along the walks after them they ran much faster than he could. At last he gave up and wandered about the city for hours, speaking to neither human nor Belfin, wondering what to do that is, he knew what he had to do, he was wondering how to do it. He would never be able to reach the Belfin of Belfins. No human being had ever done it. Mitislav and George had died trying to reach him, or it. Even though their intentions had been hostile and Ludovic's would be helpful, there was little chance he would be allowed to reach the Belfin with all the other Belfins against him. What guarantee was there that the Belfin would not be against him too? and yet he knew that he would have to risk his life. There was no help for it. He had never wanted to be a hero, and here he had heroism thrust upon him. He knew he could not succeed. Equally well, he knew he could not turn back, for his Belfin teacher had instructed him in the meaning of duty. It was twilight when he approached the Blue Tower. Commending himself to the infinite virtue, he entered. The Belfin at the reception desk did not give off the customary smiling expression. In fact, he seemed to radiate a curiously apprehensive aura. "'Go back, young man,' he said. "'You're not wanted here. I must see the Belfin of Belfins. I must warn him against the Flockharts.' "'He has been warned,' the receptionist told him. "'Go home and be happy. I don't trust you or your brothers. I must see the Belfin himself." Suddenly this particular Belfin lost his commanding manners. He began to wilt, in so far as so rigidly constructed a creature could go limp. "'Please, we've done so much for you. Do this for us!' "'The Belfin of Belfins did things for us,' Ludovic countered. "'You are all only his followers. How do I know you are really following him?' How do I know you haven't turned against him?" Without giving the creature a chance to answer, he strode forward. The Belfin attempted to bar his way. Ludovic knew one Belfin was a myriad times as strong as a human, so it was out of utter futility that he struck. The Belfin collapsed completely, flying apart in a welter of fragile springs and gears. The fact was of some deeper significance, Ludovic knew, but he was too numbed by his incredible success to be able to think clearly. All he knew was that the Belfin would be able to explain things to him. Bells began to clash and clang. That meant the force barriers had gone up. He could see the shimmering insubstance of the first one before him. 
squaring his shoulders, he charged it, and walked right through. He looked himself up and down. He was alive and entire. Then the whole thing was a fraud. The barriers were not lethal, or perhaps even actual. But what of Mieczysław and George, and countless rumored others? He would not let himself even try to think of them. He would not let himself even try to think of anything save his duty. A staircase spiraled up ahead of him. A belfin was at its foot. Behind him, a barrier iridesced. "'Please, young man,' the belfin began, "'you don't understand. Let me explain.' But Ludovic destroyed the thing before it could say anything further, and he passed right through the barrier. He had to get to the top and warn the belfin of belfins, whoever or whatever he or it was, that the Flockharts had a secret weapon which might be able to annihilate it or him. Belfin after belfin Ludovic destroyed, and barrier after barrier he penetrated until he reached the top. At the head of the stairs was a vast golden door. Go no further, Ludovic Eversole, a mighty voice roared from within. To open that door is to bring disaster upon your race. But all Ludovic knew was that he had to get to the Belfin within and warn him. He battered down the door. That is, he would have battered down the door if it had not turned out to be unlocked. A stream of noxious vapor rushed out of the opening, causing him to black out. When he came to, most of the vapor had dissipated. The Belfin of Belfins was already dying of asphyxiation, since it was, in fact, a single alien entity who breathed another combination of elements. The room at the head of the stairs had been its tank. "'You fool!' it gasped. "'Through your muddle-headed integrity you have destroyed not only me, but Earth's future. I tried to make this planet a better place for humanity, and this is my reward." "'But I don't understand,' Ludovic wept. "'Why did you let me do it? Why were Mieczysław and George and all the others killed? Why was it that I could pass the barriers and they could not?' "'The barriers were triggered. To respond to hostility. You meant well, so our defenses could not work." Ludovic had to bend low to hear the creature's last words. "'There is Earth proverb. Should have warned me. I can protect myself against my enemies. But who will protect me from my friends?' The Belfin of Belfins died in Ludovic's arms. He was the last of his race, so far as earth was concerned, for no more came. If, as they had said themselves, some outside power had sent them to take care of the human race, then that power had given up the race as a bad job. If they were merely exploiting earth, as the malcontents had kept suggesting, apparently it had proven too dangerous or too costly a venture. Shortly after the Belfin's demise, the Flockharts arrived en masse. "'We won't need your secret weapons now,' Ludovic told them dully. "'The Belfin of Belfins is dead.' Corisanda gave one of the rippling laughs he was to grow to hate so much. "'Darling, you were my secret weapon all along!' She beamed at her relatives, and it was then he noticed the faint lines of her forehead. I told you I could use the power of love to destroy the Belfins." And then she added gently, "'I think there is no doubt who is the head of this family now.' The uncle gave a strained laugh. "'You're going to have a great little first lady there, boy,' he said to Ludovic. First lady?' Ludovic repeated, still absorbed in his grief. "'Yes, I imagine the people will want to make you our first president by popular acclaim.' Ludovic looked at him through a haze of tears. "'But I killed the Belfin. I didn't mean to, but they must hate me.' "'Nonsense, my boy. They'll adore you. You'll be a hero.' Events proved him right. Even those people who had lived in apparent content under the Belfins, 
accepting what they were given and seemingly enjoying their carefree lives, now declared themselves to have been suffering in silent resentment all along. They hurled flowers and adulatory speeches at Ludovic and composed extremely flattering songs about him. Shortly after he was universally acclaimed president, he married Corisanda. He couldn't escape. "'Why doesn't she become president herself?' he wailed, when the relatives came and found him hiding in the ruins of the Blue Tower. The people had torn the tower down as soon as they were sure the Belfin was dead, and the others thereby rendered inoperate. "'It would spare her a lot of bother.' "'Because she is not the Belfin slayer the uncle said, dragging him out. "'Besides, she loves you. Come on, Ludovic, be a man!' So they hauled him off to the wedding, and amid much feasting he was married to Corisanda. He never drew another happy breath. In the first place, now that the Belfin was dead, all the machinery that had been operated by him stopped, and no one knew how to fix it. The sidewalk stopped moving, the air conditioner stopped conditioning, the food synthesizer stopped synthesizing, and so on. And, of course, everybody blamed it all on Ludovic, even that year's run of bad weather. There were famines, riots, plagues, and, after the waves of mob hostility had coalesced into national groupings, wars. It was like the old days again, precisely as described in the textbooks. In the second place, Ludovic could never forget that, when Corisanda had sent him to the Blue Tower, she could not have been sure that her secret weapon would work. Love might not have conquered all. In fact, it was the more likely hypothesis that it wouldn't, and he would have been killed by the first barrier. And no husband likes to think that his wife thinks he's expendable. It makes him feel she doesn't really love him. So in thirtieth year of his reign as dictator of Earth, Ludovic poisoned Corisanda. That is, had her poisoned, for by now he had a minister of assassination to handle such little matters, and married a very pretty, very young, very affectionate blonde. He wasn't particularly happy with her either, but at least it was a change. The End of The Blue Tower by Evelyn E. Smith Cogito Ergo Sum by John Foster West. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Are the spirit and the flesh one and the same thing? Or are they separate entities, dependent and at the same time independent of each other? Perhaps some great cosmic law holds this secret. But the one universal element that we can depend upon, apparently, is the lucky accident. A warped instant in space, and two egos are separated from their bodies, and lost in a lonely abyss. Cogito Ergo Sum by John Foster West I think, therefore I am. That is the first thought I had. Of course, not in the same symbols, but with the same meaning. I awakened, or came alive, or came into existence suddenly. At least my mental consciousness did. Here am I, I thought. But what am I? Why am I? Where am I? I had nothing to work with except pure reason. I was there because I was not somewhere else. I was certain I was there, and that was the extent of my knowledge at the moment. I looked about me. No, I reasoned about me. I was surrounded by nothingness, by black nothingness, a vacuum. Immense distances away I could detect light, or rather, I could perceive waves of force passing around me which originated at points vast distances away vast in relation to my position in the nothingness. There were waves of force all about me, varying in frequency. The nothingness was alive with waves of force, traveling parallel and tangentially to each other 
without seeming to interfere one with another. I measured them, differentiated between them, and finished with the task in a matter of seconds. How could I do it? It was one of the capacities I was created with. What was I? I perceived the waves of force. I perceived great quantities of mass, solid, liquid, gas, whirling in vacuum, mass built up out of patterns of basic force. I searched my own being, analyzing myself. I was not gas. I was not solid. I was not even force. Yet I existed. I could reason. I was a beginning, a sudden beginning and I had duration because I knew that time had elapsed since the moment I awakened, though I had no means of telling how much time, or of even naming the period. Could I really be pure reason? Can reason exist? Can rational entity exist without a groundwork of matter, or at least of force? It could. It must. I was rational entity, and I existed yet I could find nothing of force, nothing to occupy space about myself. For all I could ascertain, I might have covered a one-dimensional point in eternity, or I might have been spread throughout vast distances. From this reasoning, I concluded that rational entity might occur either as some force unlike that of all the natural phenomena in space, or as some combination of these forces, at the moment beyond my power to analyze, even detect. I finished with that for the time being. How did I come into being? I discarded the question as unanswerable temporarily. What was I before that instant? I suddenly reasoned, cogito ergo sum. I could not say. How did I know I even existed, really? Obviously, because I was capable of rational thought. But what was thinking? First it was perceiving, and accepting my own existence. Beyond that, it was recognizing the dark nothingness around me, and the forces it contained. I had to exist. But how did I know nothingness was right? And how did I know its darkness was right? And how did I know waves of force were waves and force? And how did I know matter was matter, and that I was none of these? Symbols, I reasoned. I'm thinking in symbols. I could not reason without symbols, therefore I could not exist, as I am, without symbols to think with. Yet whose symbols were they? Where and how did I come by them? I could think back clearly to the instant of my creation, yet I had not invented the symbols in the interim of my existence, nor had they been given to me. What then? They were part of me when I came alive in this universe, had been invented some other time and elsewhere by someone else, or by what I was before I became the entity of reason I now was. Then that first flash of perception in nothingness was not spontaneous. There was something behind it. I was something before that moment, in another era of time, perhaps a creature of substance. But what? I concentrated. I remembered the symbol moral. I was, or had been, an entity moral. Were there others back there somewhere? There must have been, must be yet. Was I the only moral who had metamorphosed into this state of rational entity? Surely not. Yet I could contact no other rational around me as far away as I could probe. How far was that? How could I know? Was it far enough to reach the other morals? Or were they scattered thinly throughout infinity around me, like the flecks of mass? I was suddenly ill. The symbol malaise came to me as a proper description of my malady. I grew dizzy with my sickness. I wished to regurgitate, to cast off this cold, frightening sensation. Yet I was provided with no physical means of doing it. It filled me throughout all my thinking. 
it was I. I thought to exist. I thought depression, sickness. Therefore I was the malady, and it was a hell of a malcontent beyond symbolic description. What was wrong with me? Was I frightened? I was concerned for my existence here alone. What was it called? The idea shimmered there on the fringe of perception, then fairly leapt into my consciousness. Existing alone, as pure reason, was worse than no existence, was worse than dying, or having never been at all. I need another morrow. To exist happily I must have at least one other morrow to communicate with, to share my thoughts, to share my being. Is this a necessity, a condition peculiar to me as I am, as reason? Or is it a condition that came across the barrier with me, from that other state? It must be the latter. An entity of pure reason, having come into existence as reason, would need nothing but himself. Why? Because he would be without emotion. I am emotional, I thought. I am entity of almost pure reason, but I have inherited emotion from my previous state. It is a disorder of thought, but it can be a pleasant disorder when the emotion is the right one, or, if unpleasant, when satisfied. But I could not have emotion as I am now. They are cortical responses, or are supposed to be. What is cortical? No, they are sort of illogical reasoning, nothing physical. The rest eluded me. I am lonely, I thought. Loneliness stems from fear, and fear is a basic emotion. I am very lonely. I have been lonely for a long time, bringing it with me here. I would rather sate my loneliness than live to eternity, than know all there is to know. What can quell my loneliness? Another like me, another moral, whatever a moral is. I must have, must find, another moral. I began to search. I darted frantically about space like a frightened thing, though I could perceive no movement. I knew I passed from one area of space to another because I could measure slight changes in the position of the stars about me. I knew the points of light were stars. There was duration. I could not know how much. Eternity, a split second. But at last I discovered another like me. No, almost like me. But another moral. The other entity had less of reason, more emotion. It was frightened and lonely. The moral's whole existence was that of sickness, of loneliness, which is fear. The moral was darting about madly, seeking, seeking a thing like itself. What was it, like me, but different? As I came in, I measured our similarities and differences. Rationally, we were identical, or almost so. Emotionally, we were different, vastly different. Morals appear to exist as rational and emotional, I reasoned. Beyond that, I cannot go. The other moral perceived me, darted frantically toward me, then slowed. We came together, touched like, like two cautious fish meeting in a dark pool and touching mouths to substantiate identical species. The other moral was satisfied with my identity. It leapt frantically at me, raced around me, through me, finally stopped, pervading me, while vibrating in sheer relief and happiness. I felt the great fear loneliness in the other moral begin to recede, and in its place came an almost overpowering euphoria. It was contentment, and it stemmed from the basic emotion love. I knew this at once. I suddenly realized that I too was relieved, that I was no longer sick with fear loneliness. It was good, this existing of the other within me, or simultaneously with me? Or was it I within the other? It sated our fear emotion, 
and made, created, a love euphoria. I am happy I found you, I communicated. I was lonely for another morrow. You are a morrow. The other hesitated, thinking. No, I am Pat. I am different from you. But it is chiefly emotional. It is good. You are a Pat, I returned in disappointment. I had hoped to find another morrow. Don't be disappointed, the Pat soothed. We are alike, really, almost so. Like, like flame and gas are both substance, yet different. We are two types of the same thing. I am no longer frightened. I am no longer lonely. You are good for me. I was relieved because I wanted to be. I believed the other moral, no, the pat, because I wanted to believe. I did not bother to rationalize. I felt elation. Then in the other time, that other place we both belonged to, a, a common group with another name, I suggested. I believe so, the pat answered. How was it when you came awake? I asked. Can you remember? I think so. I recall I was born here in fright because it was all wrong. I was not in my natural state, so it was not right. The Pat paused to think. I remember there was great speed and I was born in fright. Were you? No, I answered. I was not frightened at first. I was never frightened to the degree you were. I was mostly lonely, which is related to fear. But when I first conceived my existence here, I was coolly logical. I awakened reasoning, realizing that I existed. I suppose it has to do with our emotional differences, the pat beside me, or with me, or within me, communicated. Do you recall where in space you came from? I asked. I must have been doubting my existence at first so intensely that I did not observe. You seem to have taken your own being for granted. Thus you were, perhaps, more observant. I... I think so. The Pat hesitated, and I knew it was observing the stars around us. Yes, come with me. I think I know where. I stayed with the Pat a part of it, and we lurched through space. Rather, we ceased to exist at one point in space, and existed in another. How far? Distances meant nothing. It was here, the Pat informed me finally. Something was wrong here. The interweaving waves of force were all wrong. There was a disorder, a great cancer in space. The waves interfered with the progress of each other all along a great barrier. It was not natural, not like it was elsewhere. Something is wrong with the waves of force crossing this area. They interfere with each other. New forces are created. Do you detect it? I communicated. I feel it, the Pat answered. It is a sickness in space, like, like our loneliness. I knew the comparison was ridiculous, but I let it pass. You said you came alive at great speed. I could have been traveling, too. We must have plunged into this barrier. It seems to me that emotions must originate in a physical being. Perhaps reason could be free, but not emotion. I don't know, but I have a theory. I believe our physical selves still exist somewhere in space. The barrier, perhaps, interfered with the normal functioning of our mental equipment. We exist at one point in space, and we are thinking, experiencing emotions at another point. It's as if our minds are, are broadcasting our thoughts and emotions far away from our physical selves. Either that, or our rationales were torn free, and only our emotions are broadcast. Does that sound logical? Yes, the Pat agreed. I believe that is the answer. 
I felt that the Pat was pleased with my theory, that it was greatly admiring my reasoning. I also perceived that it had no idea what I meant by the explanation. I did not mind. You said you were moving at great speed, I continued. Can you remember the line, the direction you were traveling in? The Pat hesitated for a moment. Yes. You perceive the star cluster there, the triangular one? My heading was in that direction, but it was changing fast. Then we could find nothing by traveling toward the triangular cluster? No. I was moving in an arc in the direction of the distorted square cluster there. Do you see it? Yes, I answered, knowing that her use of the word C was unconscious. That is Cetus. Cetus? The Pat was startled. How do you know that? I don't know. The name came to me. It seemed right to call it that. It's... it's all so frightening. I had no time for pampering our emotions, though I was at great peace with the Pat so near me. Time might prove vital. Neither would it do any good to travel in the direction of Cetus, I said. No, no, the Pat communicated. If there is any object of matter or force I was a part of in that other existence traveling through space, it is in an arc. The best we can do is take an arbitrary direction between the triangular cluster and the one called Cetus, and hope to intercept the object, the other part of me, whatever it is. Come with me, I ordered. I discovered the object of mass hurling through space before the Pat did. It was symmetrical and metallic. I tore myself away from my companion and darted to meet it. I discovered it was a shell, a hollow thing, and I passed inside. There was a room there. There were projections and circles of transparent matter. I experienced the symbol, dials. There were two other creatures seated close to the dials, things of matter, and their substance was protoplasm but there was no rationale present in either of them. I examined the living matter of the smaller one swiftly. Organs seemed poised in a suspended state. The creature I observed, housed in a protective shell, seemed paralyzed or dead. I remembered the word dead. Then the Pat was with me again. I... I feel something, Marl. I am frightened. What are they, those things there? They seem to be. I stopped communicating. The Pat had disappeared. The thing of protoplasm nearest me was moving, but I was no longer interested. I remembered the Pat had touched the upper extremity of the creature and had vanished, had ceased to be. The old sickness was back. I was lonely. I wanted the other entity. I could not, did not wish to exist without the Pat. I darted frantically about the metal shell, here and there, searching, searching. Where was the Pat? I screamed for it. I thought Pat as far away as I could reach. But there was no reaction, no response at all. In my frenzy, I was back beside the creature of protoplasm before I realized it, near the one I had not yet examined. Perhaps they took her, I thought. It was not logical, but it was a hope. Hope is emotional. I was becoming more emotional than rational. I touched the larger of the two creatures, experimentally, moved cautiously inside it, searching, searching. Suddenly I was seized by a great force, an inexorable power that grasped me and wrenched me, tearing me from the point in space I had occupied a moment before. My perception blurred, but I was not frightened. Without the Pat I did not care what happened. I was intensely curious. So this is how it is, I reasoned in a flash, to cease to be, and I ceased to be. Marlowe shook his head. I must have dozed, he thought. 
He glanced at the chronometer on the console ahead. No, only a minute or two had elapsed since the last time he had checked. Sleepyhead, wake up and live. He looked to his right. Pat sat in the navigator's seat, smiling at him. I didn't sleep, honestly, he protested. We hit some sort of barrier back there. It knocked me out for a moment. I had the damnedest impression. Remember what you promised, she swiveled in the seat to face him. No more scientific lectures on the mysteries of space, or I'll return to Earth. You know my poor brain can't absorb it. You win, he grinned, running calloused fingers through his gray crew cut. He leaned forward and kissed her briefly. How did an old space hermit like me ever win a flower garden bride in the first place? They laughed together, and he felt secure within the metallic shell surrounding them, no longer alone. The end of Cogito Ergo Sum by John Forrester West.